Thank you. Thank you. The next item of business is a debate on motion 17425 in the name of Richard Leonard on Build Them at Bifab. Um, I can ask those members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now. And I call on Richard Leonard to speak to and move the motion. Mr Leonard, please. Uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, let me begin by declaring an interest. I am a proud member of both of the trade unions that represent the workers employed at the Bifab Yards in Fife and at Arnish Point. Let me declare another interest at the very start. I've been privileged in my life to work for the Scottish Trades Union and Labour Movement, representing working people across Scotland. They have taught me a lot. It's been a great education. And they are the people who drive me on when the going gets tough in politics. Because there is so much that can be achieved by working women and men through industrial organisation and industrial action, but so much more that can be achieved through political organisation and political action, which is why we have brought this debate to Parliament today. So let me make it abundantly clear that Scottish Labour stands shoulder to shoulder with the Fife workers at those construction yards in Methyl and Burnt Island. That Scottish Labour fully backs the Fife Ready for Renewal campaign, calling for the work that was promised to the Fife Yards to be delivered to the Fife Yards. I first visited the yard at Methyl when it was owned by RGC over 25 years ago. In those days, it was bidding for oil and gas contracts in the North Sea. The union convener was the late and much missed Jock Kilbane. It was an industry beset by famine and feast. Full order books one year, empty order books the next. It was also a yard in dire need of investment. So when I went back to visit the yard 18 months ago, I was shocked to see that in the intervening quarter of a century, there had been little capital investment. That whilst now the contracts sought were in the emergent offshore renewable energy industry, rather than in the hydrocarbon energy industry, it was still a tale of famine and feast. And that the industrious workforce caught in this market failure, this failure to plan, were endure enduring a prolonged period of famine. They deserve so much better than this. And just as in the oil years, still bidding for contracts on the UK continental shelf, and in Scottish inland waters, but still seeing the work going to yards overseas. It is as though we have learned nothing. We used to lobby the UK Energy Minister for intervention to act to correct the uneven playing field. And the unions are doing that again with Claire Perry. But we should not have to keep fighting the same battles over and over again. It's as though we have learned nothing. And now, of course, we have this parliament and an opportunity to not simply protest, but to govern. Not simply to lobby about the economy, but to plan the economy. Not simply to pass motions, but to take action. And if ever there was a case to prove the need for a Scottish industrial strategy made in Scotland, this is it. Here we have millions of pounds of public expenditure through subsidies and through levies invested from consumers in renewable energy in order to harness a natural resource. Yet there is no public accountability and all too often too little economic benefit. Our economy should not be a democratic free zone. Companies like EDF should not be exempted from responsibility Promises made should be kept and communities like Fife should benefit directly from the jobs dividend that renewable energy should bring. Because I tell you, there's no point having a green industrial revolution. There is no point in a green new deal if the new deal is the same as the old deal. If the outcomes of the new deal are the same as the outcomes of the old deal. And if the revolution, this green industrial revolution, ends up being one simply being driven by the market, 
in which transnational corporations can sell out working people in Scotland and offshore jobs to the Far East. If, on the other hand, the green revolution, this green industrial revolution, means an interventionist state acting on behalf of the people and acting on behalf of our industrial communities so that we go beyond the market, then I declare myself a revolutionary. If it is simply a revolution of the market, of more laissez-faire economics all over again, then I declare myself to be a counter-revolutionary, because it will be nothing short of a betrayal if the work on EDF's offshore wind farm, Nyash Nar Goya, worth up to two billion pounds, located, located just 10 miles off the Fife coast, if that work is sent around the world to Indonesia. This is work that has the potential to create a thousand green jobs for Fife, fulfilling the promise to the hundreds of those former BIFAB workers, skilled workers, who stand ready to work. For EDF to send these jobs elsewhere would not only be a betrayal of those workers, it would be a betrayal of an entire community and a betrayal too of Scotland's commitments on climate change. Because as I've stated before in this parliament, the Scottish TUC put it well. The transportation of these structures from Southeast Asia back to Scotland would generate emissions equivalent to an extra 35 million cars on the road. What does that do for the climate emergency? So in the midst of this climate crisis, we must send a clear message to EDF that if it wishes to be part of Scotland's renewable energy future, it must stand by the promises made to the communities and workers of Fife, because meeting the challenge of the climate emergency requires more than words. We must match our ambition with action. The driving force of change when it comes to our response to the climate emergency is first and foremost determined by who owns and controls our economy. And so we have to ask, is our economy, are our systems for producing energy, our transport system, our use of land and agriculture operated purely for profit or are they planned for the common good? This is the fundamental question that we must ask and it should be central in the consideration of the award of all renewable energy job contracts because we will not secure the transformative change that we need to see by leaving it all to market forces. And for those who need further convincing, go and read the hard-hitting report entitled Broken Promises and Offshore Jobs, presented to the Scottish TUC in Dundee at its Congress just last month. And let me quote the opening pages of that report. The STUC is absolutely committed to building a low carbon economy and meeting climate change targets. However, we are criticising the failure of industrial policy to ensure that workers, businesses and government in Scotland benefit from Scotland's natural resources. So Scottish Labour are clear. For us, it is not just a failure of industrial policy, but a complete failure of governments, British and Scottish, to develop an industrial strategy in the first place. The BIFAB workers are now feeling all too keenly the effects of what happens when we do not, as a nation, make every effort to ensure that it is the people who benefit from our natural resources rather than private profit. The owners of the NNJ contract are EDF, the French state-owned energy company and nuclear giant. EDF is one of the world's largest producers of energy and in 2018, its revenues were around 60 billion pounds. EDF promote their better plan, better plan for sustainable and responsible energy and building stronger communities.
the EDF Renewables website says, we also use companies local to a wind farm during the development of a site whenever possible to ensure the local economy benefits from its build too. But unfortunately, in this case for the BIFAB workers, it seems that EDF are all talk. We cannot repurpose the Scottish economy and deliver the Green New Deal that is needed without a serious step change in how we do things. Old ideas about rolling back the state, about privatisation, simply no longer cut it when it comes to how we plan our economy and so how we meet our climate targets. If we are serious about climate change, why would we accept the construction of turbine jackets for renewable energy wind farms that are only 10 miles off the coast of Fife should be shipped around the world when there is a skilled local workforce, unemployed but ready and willing to take up the task? But making this a reality involves an innovative state. It means the Scottish Government using its powers of procurement and planning to make sure that low carbon developments, just like this EDF project, which could benefit thousands of people in Fife, bring economic benefit to local communities. There is a growing restlessness across all generations and a rising determination, which this parliament must reflect on the need for urgent action to tackle the climate change challenges that face us. I am optimistic that we can achieve the transformative change that is required. But achieving a planned and just transition to green jobs requires us to take action now, today, and ensure that these jobs are here for tomorrow and the future. That's why today we unequivocally back the Fife Ready for Renewal campaign and why a Scottish Labour government would ensure full trade union involvement in economic and industrial planning. We back the calls for a review of the contracts and the supply chain process of the offshore wind sector deal to ensure that it brings significant work to the Fife Yards during the construction phase of all these projects. And that is why I urge the Scottish Government today to join us in calling on EDF to rethink their decision to invest in the communities, in the workforce and in the people of Fife, to invest in those skills, to invest in a future for those yards. Let's make sure that these contracts, that these jackets are fabricated, are built at BIFAB. I move the motion in my name. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Leonard. I now call on Derek Mackay uh, to speak to and move Amendment 17425.3. Cabinet Secretary, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I move the amendment in my name and I welcome the opportunity to publicly discuss our support for Scotland's offshore wind sector and the action we're taking to maximise Scottish supply chain content. And I also welcome the constructive approach of both the Labour Party and the STUC to this uh, debate. I will try and maintain that consensus throughout, but of course I'd refer all members to our energy strategy, which does include ambitions around supply chain and local content. And I think it's really important today that we don't let developers off the hook because I believe they are watching. So I believe this is therefore a timely opportunity to, as a united parliament, send a strong message to the sector on the subject of fabrication and industrial jobs as we have this just transition. We all know the opportunity. The waters around the UK currently have the largest installed capacity of offshore wind anywhere in the world. The offshore wind sector deal sets out an ambition to see offshore wind contributing up to 30 gigawatts of capacity by 2030. And the Committee on Climate Change stated that the UK may need up to 7,500 offshore wind turbines by 2050 in a net zero world. Therefore, we agree with the view that the UK and Scotland has not been securing the levels of economic benefits and jobs from these projects that we deserve. However, despite key powers lying out with our control, we as a government are determined to maximise the job opportunities and economic benefits in Fife and across Scotland. That's exactly why I chaired a supply chain summit at the start of this month, bringing together governments. So I was disappointed that the energy 
Uh, Minister was not in attendance from the UK government, despite her assurance uh, that she would be. But nonetheless, I brought together the governments, uh, unions, offshore wind developers and supply chain representatives, where I made the position of the Scottish government very clear. I shall return to my proposed action shortly, but first I wish to turn specifically to BIFAB. The Scottish Government's ongoing commitment has given BIFAB the best possible chance of winning contracts and securing new work. We've provided strong support to DF Barnes since their acquisition of BIFAB. However, we've been clear from the outset that there remained hard work ahead to securing a long-term future of the company. BIFAB is a competitive yard with a highly skilled workforce. And I uh, Yes, I will. David Torrance. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for taking an intervention. Scottish Enterprise has invested in the yard over a number of years. Um, can the Cabinet Secretary advise whether Scottish Enterprise will continue to invest in the, the yard to modernise and upgrade fabrication facilities? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, th there are meetings that will be held with a range of stakeholders and partners to try and allow further investment into the yards. Of course, it has to be stated compliant as long as we're complying with those rules as part uh, of the <laughs> EU, but I am looking for every possible opportunity to allow further investment by Scottish Enterprise uh, into the yard. And of course, we'll continue to explore those opportunities and seize them as and when they arise. But what I'm concerned about particularly is reports of low tender bids from outside the UK that suggest that they, alongside other supply chain companies in the sector, have not been afforded that level playing field that we try and comply with during these processes. So I have repeatedly engaged industry stakeholders, including EDPR, EDF Renewables, SSE and Tier 1 contractors, to emphasise the importance of utilising the Scottish supply chain, and I'll continue to do so. I remain cautiously confident that contracts will be secured for BIFAB, which will see work not only return to Arnish, but also to Methyl and Burnt Island. But I repeat the pledge that this government will do everything possible to support those yards. Now, returning directly to the summit, members of the offshore wind sector have committed to undertaking strategic capability assessment of fabrication in the UK to ensure that we fully understand the actions required by all parties to overcome the key barriers faced by the supply chain, the issues that they say are difficult. But, presiding officer, in relation to Scottish content, I believe the sector has let us down and I will not be simply hoping for improvement. That is why the Scottish Government is exploring a range of potential regulatory instruments, levers and powers that we will seek to use. Scottish ministers are working with Crown Estate Scotland to explore ways by which the new Scotland leasing round can incentivise use of Scottish supply chain. Alongside this, building on new powers devolved to the Scottish Parliament, of course. Can I, can I thank him for giving way? Can you explain why that measure wasn't put in place with previous rounds? Why are we not seeing Crown Estate leases reflecting the need for local content? Cabinet Secretary. Because the powers have just been devolved to the Scottish Parliament and therefore we're using those new devolved powers that we didn't have previously when previous uh, contracts and consents were awarded. Now we have those powers. I'm proposing to explore their use to achieve the outcome that hopefully we are uniting on in a parliament, uh, as a parliament today. So it is now the ability to do those things that we didn't have before that I am actually using uh, for this uh, uh, outcome. Proposing to use requires further exploration but I think there's a willingness uh, to use these powers uh, in this fashion. But we're also reviewing the process for submission and approval of offshore wind decommissioning uh, programmes. Once a decommissioning programme has been received, Marine Scotland, certain securities for decommissioning, over £2.5 million, require approval by the Finance and Constitution Committee of the Scottish Parliament. If the committee is consent with the financial liability and the measures in place to reduce that liability, it can approve the decommissioning programme, which will then be submitted to Scottish ministers for final approval. However, I'm determined to ensure that both the Scottish Government and the Scottish Parliament have clear sight on the overall costs and benefits to the public purse, including those in the supply chain, when considering the financial liability the Scottish taxpayer may ultimately carry. So in other words, if the Scottish taxpayer is going to provide financial guarantees, then we expect 
developers deliver for the Scottish economy in return. This demonstrates their commitment to explore all those policy levers at our disposal to increase local content from energy projects in Scotland, a real just transition. However, the UK government must also act given our lack of devolved powers in this area. The UK government's contract for difference CFD supply chain process provides an ideal opportunity to hold developers to account and provide clear assurances to the UK supply chain. This will be essential if the 60% UK content by 2030 committed to in the offshore wind sector deal is to be achieved, but show the path to get to that policy ambition with the levers that they have. So the UK government must look at the current and future CFD allocation rounds to ensure that the project owners, developers deliver, and if not, there should be repercussions. The CFD process should also be reviewed to ensure it delivers value for money for the whole economy. So while the competitive process has driven ever lower prices for electricity, it has encouraged a race to the bottom that will inevitably see work go to yards outside the UK. That is not acceptable. So supply chain companies themselves have a role to play and I can commit to uh, Scottish Enterprise support to allow them to up their game as well, to, to collaborate and focus on the opportunities together. Uh, but, but briefly and finally, presiding officer, I do hope that members are assured of the new steps that we are taking to ensure the success of BIFAB and the wider supply chain in Fife and right across the country, enabling them to take full advantage of the opportunities presented by the offshore wind industry in Scotland and beyond. And if we unite as a parliament, I'm sure that the industry will be watching and responding accordingly. Uh, thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. Can I advise members that, they, you know, I will let you make up time to take interventions until I run out of time. I mean, that speaks for itself. So I call on Dean Lockhart to speak to and move Amendment 17425.2. Mr Lockhart, please. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, let me start by referring to my register of interest in relation to a smart meter company based in England. Uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, this is an important debate on the future of BIFAB and renewable energy projects in Scotland. We will be voting today for both the Labour motion and the SNP amendment. And we are firmly supporting the STUC's campaign that Fife is ready for renewables. The Scottish Conservatives share the real concerns of the ST STUC, BIFAB and other stakeholders that the sponsor of the NNG project, EDF, plans to subcontract the manufacturing of wind turbine jackets overseas rather than place this work with yards in Fife. These, come, these concerns come at a critical time for the project. It's a project worth more than two billion pounds located less than 10 miles from the coast of Fife and which will generate enough electricity to power a city the size of Edinburgh. The Scottish Conservatives are clear that there are compelling reasons to bring these jobs and investment to Fife. The yards and methyl in Burnt Island are ready for the work that could create up to 1,000 jobs, unlock, unlocking much needed growth and investment in the Fife region. The workers in Fife have the proven skills and the experience to deliver on this project and DF Barnes, the owner of BIFAB, has the global experience to deliver. Another vital consideration is the carbon emission involved in having these turbine jackets shipped overseas 7,000 miles to Scotland instead of being built just 10 miles from the wind farm. For these reasons, the Scottish Conservatives agree with calls across the chamber and we will join the other parties uh, in calling for the manufacturing of these uh, turbine jackets uh, to be placed in Fife. We also call on the Scottish Government to follow through on the undertaking, undertakings um, it gave following the Supply Chain Summit on the 2nd of May. At this summit, the Cabinet Secretary said he would use every uh, lever at his disposal, every power, to ensure that Scotland's renewable supply chain will benefit from the expansion of, of offshore wind in Scottish waters. This could include attaching supply chain conditions and incentives to procurement contracts, uh, to leases and other project approvals granted by the Scottish government. But in his opening uh, statement, the Cabinet Secretary didn't really go into specific actions that he would take to now to secure the work to be placed at the five yards and how the Scottish Government will change its policy going forward 
I will now second how the Scottish Government will change its policy going forward to secure more Scottish content, including changing procurement practice and policies uh, in Scotland. Now, I was going to say I look forward to hearing uh, more concrete actions from the Cabinet Secretary, but it looks like he's about to explain what how he is going to assure that more work is given to the Yards and Five Cabinet Secretary. Can I just say a little thing, formal thing, don't both be standing at the same time. Cabinet Secretary, I'm calling you now. I'm just particularly eager, uh, presiding officer. It, it doesn't just... matter if you're eager, you don't do it. Thank you, Cabinet <laughs> Secretary. Point taken, presiding officer. Uh, two key uh, issues I've raised today in exploring exhaustively all of the powers that we could use the new elements are around decommissioning, specifically what has to be put to Parliament, and also use of the Crown Estate, which has been devolved to Scotland. I cannot use some of the other areas that have been suggested, but I'm determined within our competencies to use those, and I would seek the consensus of Parliament to progress with them as we explore them, to make that culture of expectation about investment in Scotland real and meaningful, and not just wait for the sector to deliver. That's two key areas I've outlined today. Mr Lockhart. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, we will work together with you uh, on, on those areas. It does, I, I appreciate some of these powers have come to the Scottish Parliament and, and the Scottish Government recently, but it does, does beg the question uh, in terms of the powers that have been with the Scottish Government for, for a long term, uh, what you have been doing in the past to secure uh, more work using those powers. Uh, Presiding officer, let me also make it clear that responsibility for securing more work uh, in the supply chain does lie also with the UK government. And today we're also calling on the UK government to take steps to encourage EDF to award work uh, to the Fife Yards and elsewhere in Scotland. And I have written to the UK minister to meet with her to explore what actions can be taken. Uh, I'd like to make a bit of progress, but Mr Mason, I'll, I'll, I'll give way uh, a bit later. Uh, Presiding officer, the, the risk that these turbine jackets will be built overseas is uh, uh, the latest example of how the Scottish Government has really failed to realise the potential in the renewable sector. We heard earlier about the GMB report that sets out a history of broken promises to the renewables industry in Scotland. The report shows that over the past decade, there have been many promises of a jobs and manufacturing bonanza in the sector. In 2010, the SNP's low carbon economic strategy promised 130,000 jobs. Let, let, no, let me, let, let me continue, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, uh, this strategy promised 130,000 jobs in renewables by 2020. Alex Salmon proclaimed that Scotland would become the Saudi Arabia of renewable energy. In reality, according to the latest ONS figures, there are just over 21,000 full-time jobs in renewable energy in Scotland. That's less than 20% of the amount of jobs that were pr promised. I'm sorry, I've only got seven minutes. We also have a negative balance of trade in the low carbon and renewable sector in Scotland. We import 230 million pounds more than we export, export in this sector, showing that the manufacturing base in Scotland is not benefiting from the growth in renewable energy. Uh, this failure to realise Scotland's potential in renewables has also been evident in the Scottish Government's track record of investments in the sector. In 2014-2015, we saw the failure of tidal wave companies Palamas and Aquamarine with the loss of over £40 million of taxpayer money. These failures show, and I think other members have highlighted this, the Scottish Government lacks a clear long-term strategy for the renewable sector in Scotland. And the most productive action the Scottish Government can now take is to work together with the UK Government under the industrial strategy, the clean growth strategy and the offshore wind sector deal to maximise opportunities for the sector in Scotland. According to DF Barnes, Barnes, the owner of Bifab, the UK Government sector deal is a laudable commitment. They welcome the commitment to achieve 60% of UK cont uh, content in projects. The UK sector deal also provides vis visibility on future contracts for difference auctions with support of up to over half a billion pounds in the next auction to come on stream later this month. This is in addition to subsidies provided by the UK government totaling some 52 billion pounds since 2010 for the renewable sector. The UK sector deal also commits to increasing UK content to 60%, increasing exports fivefold to 2.6 billion by 2030, and increasing the representation of women in the sector to a third by 2030. Cabinet Secretary, I'll give way. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, would Dean Lockhart support the position uh, that conditionality should be attached to contracts or difference to ensure that supply chain uh, content, local content, is absolutely guaranteed rather than just hoped for as part of the wind sector deal? 
You're now in your last minute, Mr. Oh, Walker. Thank you. Uh, the UK Minister responsible has made it clear that each CFD has to be looked at on its own merits. I don't think you can put in place a blanket uh, system of conditionality. That's not, that's, not the way, that's not the way the sector works. The Cabinet Secretary knows well that's not how the sector works. Uh, President Officer, I, I do have to wrap up. Uh, the renewable sector in Scotland has benefited from the financial support, significant support from the UK government and billions of pounds in subsidies through CFDs. But as we've heard, this has not translated into the jobs, manufacturing opportunities and the investment promised by the SNP. That's because, as we saw clearly earlier today, this is a government with only one priority and it's not the renewable sector in Scotland. I move the amendment in my name. Thank you very much, Mr Locker. I now call on Mark Ruskell. Mr Ruskell, please. Thank you, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I thank the Labour Party for bringing this debate forward today? Because this is Scotland's climate emergency. It's where rhetoric meets reality. It's where communities and workers are either left behind in the fossil age or are the leaders of the renewables revolution under a Green New Deal. And we all know the lessons of history, the decimation caused by the closure of the coal mines in the 80s and the alienation of communities so cruelly parasitized by the Brexiteers in the EU referendum. Communities in Fife are now crying out for a just transition to a bright future, whether that's phasing out Moss Moran, reconnecting with rail in forgotten towns, or ramping up low carbon manufacturing. So the Greens back the Fife Ready for Renewal campaign, and it would be an utter scandal if EDF constructed a wind farm just a few miles off the Fife coast in sight of metal, where former skilled workers at Bifab have to walk past a mothballed yard every day on their way to try and find new work. Where is the climate justice in that? Where is the just transition in that? If EDF can't support jobs in the very communities that host their developments, then we should hit them where it hurts, including through divestment campaigns. Now, two years ago, we were hopeful that the pipeline of wind farms on the horizon was going to deliver jobs at Bifab, it was just a matter of bridging the gap for six months, keeping finances afloat during a traumatic few years for the company, and then contracts would flow once again. But what we've seen is a level of coordination and manipulation of procurement rules by state-backed <coughs> contractors to lock Bifab out of the work. Now, these companies are acting against the spirit and the detail of their energy consents that demand local content and demand local jobs. So to find a way to resolve this betrayal, the role of the Crown Estate Scotland as a landlord is critical alongside those of the consenting bodies. So I'm pleased that the recent offshore wind summit zeroed in on the Crown Estate's role. I very much welcome the comments of the Cabinet Secretary and his desire for ministerial direction in this regard. That's welcome. But we do need to learn the lessons here because, of course, state-backed companies will always find it easier to accept financial guarantee risks. They're able to accept losses with a strategic eye to longer-term growth in markets. And they can bear the risks to jump on the back of new markets, such as floating wind. So we also need a state that can create these new markets as well, invest and share in the rewards of investment, taking the lead and crowding in finance from the private sector. The state needs to carry the risk, especially in the early development of new technology, in a second, but not to fall into the trap of socializing all that risk only to step back and watch the rewards become wholly privatised. Alistair Allen. I thank the member for giving way. I'm conscious of the fact that um, the Arnish Yard in my own constituency has had some uh, more positive news, perhaps. But uh, does the member agree that to ensure the future for that and indeed the other yards, we need to maximise apprenticeships uh, and other training opportunities into the long term? Mark Ruskell. Absolutely, and that's critical to the Green New Deal that we need to create in Scotland, linking in education, linking in apprenticeships, and that's very much the case in Fife, where I know I've met so many uh, exciting young uh, uh, people coming through Fife College, looking to get into the renewable energy industry, but just simply not finding the apprenticeships there um, to carry them then into their careers. Um, the great uh, Labour pioneer, Tom Johnston, uh, would be spinning in his grave to see the dismantling of the state as the thinker researcher, planner, financier, builder and operator of our energy infrastructure in the UK. The legacy of his revolutionary hydro board, established under Churchill's government, was deregulated and flogged off. But it's clear that the future is wind and the deployment of offshore wind will need to grow at least doubling the project pipeline by 2030. 
wind will provide the lion's share of the energy that we need to heat, travel, and power our society within 10 years. And we need to plan out exactly what this means at the granularity that can deliver investor confidence. But it's no good Scotland being the Saudi Arabia of this renewables revolution if the kit to power it is being built in Saudi Arabia. There are still issues that need to be resolved in the offshore wind supply chain. Like Richard Leonard, I first visited the metal yard some time ago, back in 2004, and I remember being handed a tatty photocopied Scottish Enterprise marketing leaflet about the site and the investment potential. And the reality is that the level of Scottish Enterprise investment in simple things, like providing a concrete and hard standing and a paint shop, just hasn't happened. Our yards should not be oil and gas museums. They need facilities that are capable of producing at a bigger scale, 24-7, 365 days a year. And the investment at CS Wind in Campbelltown and the doubling of production there should give us the confidence to bash on with the ambitious investment needed in all parts of the renewable sector. Because the role of the courageous state is to make things happen that otherwise would not. And there are so many opportunities that lie ahead. I'll pick one. The UK Climate Change Committee said it was a no-brainer to move the ban on the sale of new fossil cars forward to 2030. And even Michael Gove indicated to me in committee recently that the UK's target date is under review. But are we acting fully on the opportunities that will come from this? Are we focusing on developing the next generation of charging technology here in Scotland? And what about the vital role that EVs and home battery usage will have in feeding back into the grid during peak demand? There are technologies and energy services to be developed that can spin out of academia, even though venture capital and markets may be cautious to invest in new areas at the beginning. The strategic thinking, the detailed planning and coordination has to come through a Green New Deal for Scotland to maximize all of these opportunities. And the climate emergency demands a level of transformative ambition never seen before. But it must come with hope, a just transition, and livelihoods for the workers at BIFAB. Thank you very much. I now call Willie Rennie. Mr Rennie, please. Uh, Natnagoch will be 10 miles off the coast of my constituency. And at the other end, we will have the Methyl and Burnt Island shipyards. This is important to Fife. It's important to Scotland as well. Now, Andy Kinsella, who was the Chief Executive Officer of Mainstream Renewable Power, who applied for Natnagoch he, for the wind farm permission, he said that the contracts for difference, after they were awarded, we can finally focus on delivering the very significant benefits this project brings to the Scottish economy and its environment. Mainstream had an economic breakdown of the project and estimated 500 jobs will be created in the three-year build phase and at least £550 million of the total project cost will be spent in the Scottish supply chain. The company also anticipated a further £1.8 billion will be spent operating the, and maintaining the array over the projected 25-year lifetime, and around 100 roles would be created. They set up the Nartnagoch Coalition, a group of about 60 organisations supporting the development. Alan Duncan, the spokesman for that coalition, said, this means the only major infrastructure project that is ready to build in Scotland next year can now go ahead, creating 2,000 jobs for each year of its four-year construction process, as well as hundreds of long-term permanent jobs. Mainstream then went on and commissioned a Fraser of Allender Institute report, which estimated that NNG would contribute 0.6% of GDP, £827 million, to the Scottish economy over the, pr the project's lifetime, creating thousands of jobs during the construction phase and over 230 operations and maintenance jobs for the 25-year lifetime of the wind farm. The carrots were dangled. Local people were encouraged to speak up. There was adverts in the local and national newspapers Local politicians like me were put under pressure. We were courted. Ministers were put under considerable pressure to support the NNG scheme. So now is the time for the new owners to deliver for Scotland. The obligation, the promises made by mainstream were inherited by EDF. Deliver now as we were promised. If this does not happen, it will be a huge mistake for EDF but also for the wider industry, because it will send a message very loud and clear that your promises mean absolutely nothing. 
EDF are now rumoured to be awarding the contract for constructing the jackets for these huge turbines to Sapien, an Italian industrial giant. They would manufacture the jackets in Indonesia, the other side of the planet. The environmental footprint alone of shipping these massive structures, and they are massive, right way around the world would be significant. This is supposed to be an environmental project. Why on earth are we constructing them this far away and committing so much energy to get them here in the first place? No, certainly. John Mason. Yeah, I thank the member for giving way. He, he talks about EDF and is he relying on their goodwill in all of this or does he feel that there should be more pressure put on them? It should be a contractual commitment to do these things. Uh, yes, Will I think there should be a contractual commitment and it's a mistake not to have a contractual commitment. It's been seen in other contracts in other parts of the energy sector. Why on earth is not being done for this? I simply do not understand. The loss to the local economy would be significant as well. Of course, the yards at Methyl need to be upgraded and investment is required as well. They need to improve efficiency. They need to improve the capacity so they can cope with the demands of this new NNG contract. Change is required to ensure they are ready, not just for this contract, but for other contracts as well in the future. Now, Gary Smith, I think he speaks with great clarity on this issue. Before the latest problem that has occurred, he said this, Promises made by politicians a decade, ago, a decade ago over Scotland's renewable industries will amount to nothing more than a puddle of snake oil. We don't have a Saudi Arabia of renewables, we were promised. And then this is really important. He says the taxpayers pour billions of pounds of subsidies into an industry that lines the pockets of other countries and private financiers instead of redistributing wealth into our own communities. If this happens, if this go ahead, and if this contract goes abroad, there will be real anger felt in the communities of Fife. The real disconnect is real, just in a second. How do we make sure that Scotland does not lose out again. I'm taking a direction. Cabinet Secretary. If investors and developers currently and planning to invest in Scotland are watching and listening to this debate, it would Willie Rennie agree with me that it would be easier, it would make their life easier if they would just invest in Scotland and they wouldn't be getting the berating that they're getting this afternoon. And you're moving into your last minute, Mr Rennie. I think that's right. Um, and I think they should listen very carefully. They should not make bold promises, put adverts in newspapers right across Scotland, encourage the support of ordinary working people in their communities to back their plans, then ship the jobs abroad. They should never, ever do that if they want these contracts in the future. So it's a big lesson for them to learn. That's why we support the Fife Ready for Renewal campaign. The work should be awarded to Fife. It should be awarded to Scotland because that is what we were promised. Thank you very much. Open debate. I call Claire Baker, who will be followed by Annabel Ewing. Ms Baker, please. Uh, President Officer, thank you. I very much welcome this afternoon's debate. The future of the five construction yards in Methil and Burnt Island is very important to me, and I've had a relationship with the workforce and their trade union since I was elected to my first term in Parliament. My first regional office was in Methyl, just along Wellesley Road from the Fife Energy Park, where Bifab is located. I first visited Bifab at a time of prosperity for the company with the then MP Lindsay Roy and the Secretary of State for Energy and Climate Change, Ed Miliband. But over the years, I have witnessed the ups and downs of that business, the struggle with the global competitiveness of the renewables manufacturing sector, the tenacity of a company which was determined to compete at a challenging level to secure work for those yards. There have been strongly mounted campaigns over the years and there have been times when the workforce has been greatly reduced. During this time, I've worked with GMB and Unite members at Methyl to apply any political pressure and garner any political support I could, working with my fellow MSPs and Scottish ministers. For me, this was not to save a company for its shareholders or to increase its profits or its company profile. My involvement and commitment to these yards is for the excellent workforce for the importance of this employment to Methyl, Leave and Mouth and Fife, and to providing a cornerstone for a positive economic future for this area. If any area in Scotland should benefit from the growth of the renewable sector, this area, 
which has a proud history of manufacturing, a strong industrial heritage, a skilled workforce, but is too often hampered by underemployment, by in-work poverty and lack of opportunity, this is it. The March on Parliament, when BIFAB was on the brink of collapse in November 2017, was a powerful demonstration of the passion and the commitment of the workforce, their families and their community. I recognise the role the Scottish Government played in the company continuing to operate and able to complete their work for the Beatrice contract, which was vitally important for the reputation of the company and the workforce. The rescue package enabled the takeover of the company by DF Barnes, and I very much welcome the positive relationships which are reported by the trade unions with the new owners, and I recognise their commitment to making a success of the business and securing work for the five yards. But it is hugely frustrating and damaging for the local economy that the yards are sitting empty. The work that has been secured at Arnish is welcome and demonstrates the ability of the company to gain work. But there is capacity to take more at this yard and crucially we need to see employment in the five yards. I will briefly mention Scottish Enterprise. BIFAB leased the yard from Scottish Enterprise and there is a need for investment into the infrastructure over the, of the yard. Over the years, there have been discussions over this, and I understand the commercial relationship there is. But there is an opportunity here to add value, and there is a workforce capable of delivering the yard improvements if the Scottish Government, through Scottish Enterprise, would commission work. I recognise the recent summit that was held by the Scottish Government and the roundtable held by the Economy, Energy and Fair Work Committee. Our motion today calls on the Scottish and the UK governments to review the contracts for difference and supply chain process as part of the offshore wind sector deal to ensure that it will bring significant work to the five yards during the construction phase of all projects. Concerns have been raised over the weaknesses of the deal. If the deal is to deliver, not just for reducing emissions, but also for our communities, it needs to set conditions to secure work in the UK, and in particular supporting the Scottish market, where we are seeing growth and a pipeline of projects. Member take an intervention on that very point. Uh, uh, again, I make the point that CFD is reserved to Westminster, consenting as, for us, we can't attach conditionality consenting, but conditionality could be attached to CFD. That might come at some cost, but that would be welcome for Scottish investment. Would the Labour Party then join with us in calling upon the UK government to allow that conditionality on contract for difference, which could be absolutely impivotal in ensuring work for Scotland? Clear Baker. I, I do accept the points made by the Cabinet Secretary and recognise the role of the UK government in this, but the summit that you held did bring together the UK government with the Scottish government. I'd ask the Scottish government to apply any pressure they can to make this a better sector for the Scottish companies to compete within. Um, so I think we need to show greater ambition for expansion in the sector and ensure that our skilled manufacturing base can see the benefit of this. We cannot continue to see companies taking advantage of Scotland's natural resources, but not investing into the people of Scotland and our communities. The Economy Committee session outlined the problems that are being faced by BIFAB, competing in what is often described as a tangled mess of contracts and payments. Witnesses were clear about their concerns over the abuse of state aid rules and the lack of a level playing field. Serious questions were asked about the status of consent letters from Marine Scotland and the subsequent failure to see the conditions which were described as expected and likely to be realised. And as the government have explained, the Crown Estate devolution powers presents us with opportunities and we need to make the best use of those. Presiding officer, the bitter disappointment of losing out on the Concordant and Murray contracts mean the yards in Fife are lying unused. Workers have not been in the yard for a year. Yards which have been mothballed and become a symbol of missed opportunity and stilled potential. But that has not dampened the commitment of the workforce and their trade unions. The launch of the Fife Ready for Renewal campaign deserves the support of all of us. The idea that EDF will award the contracts for wind turbine jackets for the NNG offshore wind farm, sitting off the coast of Fife to Indonesia to then be shipped thousands of miles to Scotland is just not acceptable. That people in Fife will see this farm from their windows but get none of the economic benefit while they are paying into the project is completely unacceptable. I am urging EDF to do the right thing, to honour commitments they have given to local investment, to support the Scottish industry and in return they will receive a highly skilled committed workforce and be able to demonstrate a commitment to reducing our carbon footprint and prove their green credentials. There is a significant majority in Parliament to recognise that around the globe we are facing a climate emergency and we in Scotland have an important role to play in tackling climate change. Changing our economy and reducing our use of oil and fossil fuel is critical to this. We support a zero carbon economy and our renewable output is a huge factor in achieving this. 
but our communities and our workforce have not been feeling the benefit of that transition. When the Fife Energy Park opened, there was optimism and promises of future well-paid, highly skilled jobs that would re-energise Leaving Mouth and Fife. As the STUC report, Broken Promises shows, less than a third of the jobs that were promised in Scotland have been delivered. This is a poor legacy for the industry so far. We need to all take responsibility for doing business differently and EDF could take a lead on this and ensure that these valuable green jobs come to Fife. I Thank urge you. them to do so. Thank you very much. Uh, I now call Annabelle Ewing to be followed by Alexander Burnett. Ms Ewing, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, and I'm pleased to have been called to speak in this important debate this afternoon. And at the outset, I would wish to say, as the MSP for Cowden Beath constituency, that I am 100% behind the BIFAB workers whose skills are second to none. And I'm also very pleased to note that the Scottish Government has once again reiterated its commitment to stand by BIFAB and to strain every sinew to secure a long-term future for the Yards, and indeed, Presiding Officer, in addition, of course, to the extraordinarily impressive fight by the BIFAB workers themselves, it is precisely because of the intervention by the Scottish Government that BIFAB still exists. For Presiding Officer, I would submit that the, the Scottish Government is no mere bystander as far as uh, workers are concerned, and indeed has the backs of workers in Scotland. And whereas uh, the UK Government is now entirely engulfed in its Brexit chaos, and Tory party leadership machinations. Fortunately, we in Scotland have a government that is getting on with the job and the job that it is doing in connection with BIFAB is to fight for uh, this work, to fight for these jobs and to fight for this growing industry in Scotland. And in this context, the recently launched BIFAB campaign entitled Fife Ready for Renewal, uh, launched by the GMB Unite and the STUC as a whole, is to be applauded for it is vital that supply chain work comes to BIFAB and of key importance in this regard in the short to medium term future as has been mentioned is the EDF NNG offshore wind farm to be located just 10 miles off the Fife coast and it would surely be as nonsensical uh, as it would be an absolute travesty if BIFAB did not receive the work for the wind turbine jackets for this significant infrastructure project. And indeed, much has been made of the environmental costs of transporting the jackets from Indonesia, rumoured to be in the mix with the contract, uh, back to, to uh, 10 miles off uh, the Fife coast. Surely, these environmental costs must be factored in to the overall total cost of the project over its lifetime. And I wrote uh, last week to the chief, chief executive of EDF making these very points, and I also stressed that the BIFAB yards at Methil and Burnt Island were ready and able to take on the work and I also highlighted the importance of that work for the Fife economy. I also took this up with the uh, Cabinet Secretary. For it is in my mind imperative that people in Scotland actually see the maximum benefit from the new generation of renewable energy technologies that are now coming on stream. And it cannot be the case that we miss out on what should be a major boost uh, uh, for, in the case of the NNG project, the Fife economy, and for other contracts for Scotland as a whole. And it is certainly the case that the supply chain must work hard to seek opportunities by, for example, making strategic investments and considering appropriate collaborations when putting in tenders for contracts. And I am pleased to note that the Scottish Government is committed to maximising the sector and uh, that its recently convened special summit uh, involving key developers and suppliers uh, was also a success. It is a pity that the UK Government Energy Minister was not able to uh, attend but I know that the trade unions were there. Uh, I understand that industry has agreed, agreed that collective, collective action is needed to ensure supply chain companies are well positioned to benefit from upcoming offshore wind projects and also I understand that industry accepts that uh, a bit of a sea change is needed in order to meet the ambitious 60% local content targets uh, that the UK government has set in its offshore wind sector uh, deal. But on that key point, of course, uh, and it's a very pertinent question that the Cabinet Secretary has posed both to the Conservatives and to the Labour Party, without conditionality in this, the contract for difference process, how on earth are we going to get these large companies to do this? This is not a game we're playing. These are people's livelihoods. We must have conditionality in this process. It is nonsensical not to have this. And I'm disappointed in particular that the Tories have just disregarded uh, that uh, pro proposition. Uh, as far as the Scottish Government is concerned, it is absolutely essential that they continue to work with the trade unions and others, uh, and of course the UK Government, to ensure 
that Scotland does get our fair share of the renewables manufacturing bonanza that we do all wish to see. Uh, and I understand that whilst the UK government is to further to that summit, have a look again at the contract for difference and supply chain process. As I say, it is essential that conditionality is ensured. And indeed, it is such a pity that this parliament does not have that power because what a difference we could make to really driving this industry uh, forward. Uh, I commend the unstinting efforts of the GMB, Unite and the SUC. And I also commend the BIFAB workers themselves, whose skills, commitment and indeed uh, impressive dignity are, I would argue, the best adverts for the future of the yard. This contract is vital for the workers, for the company and for Fife. And I know that the Scottish Government will continue to do everything it can to secure this work. And I welcome the Cab 6 pledge to that effect stated again this afternoon. Presiding officer, today our Parliament here in Scotland is sending a message, a strong message. EDF, honour the promises made and bring this vital work to Fife. Thank you, presiding officer. Thank you. I call Alexander Burnett to be followed by Alec Neil. Mr Burnett, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I note members to my Register of Interest in Renewable Energy and Manufacturing. So, considering the SNP recently announced that they are stepping up their action to combat climate change, I'm sure that the Scottish Government will be keen to implement actions that support our renewable energy sector as much as possible. And so I welcome the opportunity to talk in this debate today to promoting our offshore wind sector and the importance our renewable energy industry has to contribute towards the Scottish and UK economy. Because it is important that skilled workers like those at BIFAB are employed so that we can boost our local economy and importantly retain skilled workers in Scotland. However, disappointingly, the SNP government is still dragging their feet and whilst they will tell every media release that they intend to invest in climate change and our renewable industry, the action is lacking. And just looking at the fuel, no thanks, and just looking at the fuel poverty and climate change bill shows that both are simply not going far enough in their ambitions. And in the case, no, I think we've heard enough from the SNP today about their priorities. And in the case of, and in the case of a Fife Ready for Renewal campaign, we cannot escape the fact that constructing parts for Scotland's offshore wind farms halfway around the world and transporting them here has a carbon cost. And transport emissions are barely f f falling and made up a third of Scotland's overall emissions in 2016. But we need to take bigger steps by ensuring local companies are awarded contracts to reduce our impact on the climate. And not only that, we need to help boost our local economy and provide jobs for skilled workers. And the sector has shrunk every quarter for the past two years, the last quarter alone shrinking by 3.5%, the largest fall on record. And I spoke in a debate last year on Apprenticeship Week where I noted the importance to encourage people... Uh, thank you, Cabinet Secretary. I'm chairing the meeting. As we will soon reach... No. As we will soon reach a shortage of workers, with more than half of those in the industry reaching retirement age. Now, as we will hear from many members today, this is about more than just one firm. It's about the wider environment for businesses and how we need to be better in supporting that. Now, Scottish Renewables noted that offshore wind expansion will provide huge potential for hundreds of supply chain companies, ports and communities, which all feed into these offshore projects. And the offshore wind sector is one to be very excited about for Scotland and the UK, and is likely to reach an expected target of 50% UK content by 2020. And with it currently at 48% of UK content, a 5% increase on 2012, it shows it is moving in the right direction. And earlier this year, the UK Energy Minister announced the offshore wind sector deal, which will further reduce emissions and protect the environment. So this is a landmark agreement between the UK government and offshore wind sector, with suggestions that the UK could reach 30 gigawatts of offshore wind capacity by 2030. And this will, yes. Yeah. Alec Rowley. Full for, for Mr Burnett taking an intervention. There are workers upstairs in the gallery today who have been competing against companies, state-owned companies from overseas. There's not a level playing field and there is a view that whilst they have been trying, the UK government has been sitting on its hands. Will he push the UK government to intervene, to put the resources in and to create a level playing field? Mr Burnett. Thank you. I think, I think, 
I think we're all aware that there are state aid uh, restrictions on investment and maybe after Brexit there'll be opportunities and maybe after Brexit uh, there will be opportunities uh, to give support. Uh, 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 Cabinet Secretary, passion, so yes, excuse me, please sit down. I'm just warning you to keep a lid on it a bit, thank you very much. Mr Burnett. So not only will we see investment of up to 250 million in building a stronger UK supply chain, but also social equality commitments, such as increasing the representation of women to at least a third. And with an expected increase in the number of green jobs in the industry from 7,000 today to 27,000 by 2030, this is a great deal for the UK. And importantly, a significant number of these jobs are expected to be in Scotland. So we need the SNP to show their commitment to the renewable energy sector, to support businesses like Bifab to gain contracts, to encourage companies like EDF to recognize their environmental impact, and to take bigger steps in their ambitions to combat climate change in Scotland. Because Scotland currently has the lowest economic growth of any country in the EU, the lowest jobs growth of any region or nation in the UK, and there has been no improvement on our productivity level since 2007. So we as a country have so much to offer, but right now we are not showing it. However, we have the tools to make these statistics change, and I truly believe Scotland can be back on top. Now, thanks to the UK government, Scotland's budget is increasing by 521 million in real terms yeah. in 1920, news, with a block grant rising by 1.7%. So there can be no excuse that the SNP doesn't have the resources to help. So to the SNP government, I say invest in our climate change economy and use this extra cash to stick to your commitment to maintain Scotland's reputation as a global leader on tackling climate change. So I'm disappointed but not surprised that so far it has been all talk but no action. But I hope that they are determined to tackle the climate emergency our generation faces and we can work together to achieve ambitious climate change targets. Thank you. Thank you. I now call Alec Neil, who will be followed by Alec Rowley. Mr Neil, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I don't want to get involved in party politics in this, but I have to say the speeches from the Tory benches have been absolutely appalling this afternoon and show absolutely no commitment to Scotland whatsoever. <clears throat> and, Presiding Officer, I'm not taking any interventions from the Tory benches. Presiding Officer, yet again, here we are in Scotland, having to beg multinational companies to get some control over our own resources. This is not the first time we've been here. In terms of the North Sea, 30 and 40 years ago, we I, again were in the same situation with North Sea oil, where the Scottish people did not benefit from the great wealth from the oil in the North Sea. Not just in terms of the revenue, but in terms of the jobs, in terms of the technology, in terms of the order book, we never, ever got a fair share. And to be fair to the Labour government of Harold Wilson and Jim Callaghan, they tried to rectify that by creating an offshore supplies office and the British National Oil Corporation. Not to go and beg, but actually to take ownership of our resource and turn it into a wealth creation for Scotland and indeed other parts of the United Kingdom. And what was one of the first things the Thatcher government did when they came to power? They sold off BNOC and they got rid of the offshore supplies office. And the consequence of that is that we've never realized our full potential from oil. And here we are again, history repeating itself where this massive asset in the North Sea, as the Cabinet Secretary said, with huge potential for wind power generation. And we are not reaping the benefit of that because we don't have the power to impose conditionality. If this Parliament had the power, we would have a clear majority to impose conditionality, and that would almost solve the bifab problem overnight but we don't have that power so we've got to look at other ways until we get the power of addressing this situation and that falls into two categories first of all we've got to fight ideally on a united front for the bifab workers 
and their families. And if that means in the meantime we have to beg EDF, we have to beg them. We have to persuade them. We have to try to get the energy minister in London to exercise her power as well as us maximise the use of our power. And I think we should do all of that and I think at least most of us in this chamber are agreed with this. But the second thing we have to do in this chamber is to make sure that Scotland never gets into this position again. And if you look back at our history, if you look at hydropower, the huge resource concentrated in the north of Scotland, as Mark Ruskell said, we didn't wait for some EDF from another country to come along to manage and develop our hydro resource. We did it. Tom Johnson set up the North of Scotland Hydro Electricity Board during the war at the most difficult time to get the money to do it. So I say to the Scottish Government, if we are not going to get the powers we need, then let us look at repeating the model of the Hydro Board. Set up a Scottish National Renewable Energy Company and get it not just to uh, bid for contracts from big multinationals, but actually to develop the wind farms onshore and offshore and take control of the whole process and use that power to buy in the resources of Bifab, to give Bifab and other Scottish companies their orders, to build up an export industry in wind farm development in terms of the technology and all the rest of it. Mobilise our resources. We have vast pension funds in the public sector in Scotland. Get them to invest in that kind of dynamic process in a new company, a national company, to manage, own and develop our wind power capability. Then we don't need to go and beg. And the other thing we should do, and I would suggest to the government, in addition to all the excellent work the Scottish government has already done in relation to Bifab and the general development of renewables, in addition to that, review every power, review your planning powers, review your legislation in relation to emission controls, review your environmental powers, review your financial powers, to look at every possible way in the meantime to secure the work for Bifab, but in the longer term to make sure that we are never treated like this ever again. Our people are entitled to benefit from our own natural resources. Let us unite behind a practical programme to make that happen. Thank you. I call Alec Rowley, to be followed by David Torrance. Mr Rowley, please. I would have to agree with the majority of what Comrade, Comrade Neil had to say. For, as the windiest country in Europe, we should be angry and embarrassed that every single turbine around us has been imported. Those are the words of the former UK Energy Minister, Brian Wilson, and he is right. We should be angry, angry that we have empty yards here in Scotland, yards that are very able to produce and deliver the platforms of offshore renewable projects being built off the coast of Scotland. Yet we have seen contracts to provide those platforms being placed with companies in Belgium, in Spain, and in the United Arab Emirates, whilst Scottish yards lie empty and Scottish workers struggle to find jobs. Unite and the GMB simply say they want a level playing field. The trades unions, both Unite and the GMB, have previously criticised the failure to deliver renewable supply chain benefits to the Scottish yards and Scottish workers. They have said the jobs of the future that are critical to delivering the green energy revolution and a sustainable planet 
are being carved up by big business who don't care about Scottish workers, don't care about Scottish communities and don't care about Scotland's future. And they are right. That is why this Parliament must unite behind ensuring that the next big Scottish renewable project, an offshore wind farm worth a staggering two billion pounds located less than 10 miles from the coast of Fife brings the jobs to Scotland, brings the jobs to Fife. It would seem, as others have said, that the owners of this site, EDF, the French state-owned energy company, have a preference to award the contract to build the platforms at the other side of the world in Indonesia. This would seem to be madness given, as Richard Leonard has pointed out again and again, it is estimated that bringing these structures from Indonesia would take over 300 journeys and could generate emissions the equivalent of 35 million cars on the road. Surely this makes a mockery of any claims to be focused on tackling the climate emergency. And this hypocrisy must not only be exposed, but it must be brought to an end. We cannot have a situation where workers are told that they have to pay the price for a greener climate, whilst the speculators, the multinationals and the state-owned foreign companies rake in the profits. So let us be clear, Scottish firms are not benefiting fully from the opportunities available in the renewable energy sector, as was shown, and as Richard Leonard said, in the report from the STUC, Broken Promises. That report highlighted that fewer than a third of the jobs that were promised in Scotland's renewable energy sector have been delivered. The trades unions are working with communities in Fife and across Scotland, and the message is clear. We have our own better plan for EDF, one that works for Fife, for Scotland, and for the planet. It is really simple. Build these turbine jackets in Fife. The yards here are ready and waiting to get started on work that could create jobs for over 1,000 people, unlocking much needed investment and growth in our future. This would be good news for local communities and it would be good news for our economy. And if the bulk of the wind turbine jackets are built in yards just 10 miles from the wind farm, it would mean less shipping and significantly less carbon emissions over the lifespan of this project. That's more good news for our environment and for the future of our planet. Fife is ready for renewal and the NNG project is the opportunity that we need. We have the yards, we have the skills, mm -hmm. and we have the communities ready to play their part in tackling the climate emergency. EDF must think again and do what is right for Fife, what is right for Scotland, and what is right for our environment. And to all the parties in this parliament, I would say what we need is a proper manufacturing strategy for Scotland where the state plays a key role in securing the aims we supposedly agree upon, a just transition. There is no reason we cannot have a local and regional benefits agreement model in place for the Scottish energy sector like they do in Canada and even here in Scotland through the community benefit clauses and local government procurement contracts. In conclusion, presiding officer, I would quite simply like to reiterate that the plan put forward by Unite and the GMB, a plan that helps secure jobs in Fife and in Scotland and is better for our planet, is the right plan that this parliament should support. Build these new turbine jackets in Fife. Let's find a way to properly jumpstart the renewable supply chain in Scotland and reap the benefits for a new generation of a new green industrial revolution. Thank you. I call David Torrance to be followed by Bill Bowman. Mr Torrance, please. Thank you, President Officer.
I welcome today's motion by a Labour Party this afternoon, asking that Parliament support the Scottish Trade Union Congress Vice Ready for Renewal campaign, and I am fully supportive of that campaign. Presiding officer, I also welcome the Cabinet Secretary's commitment to BIFAB this afternoon and the support that the Scottish Government has given and will continue to give to both the companies Methil and Burntine's Yards, which are within my constituency. The Ready for Renewal campaign highlights the benefits of securing contracts in the renewable sector, which would have on BIFAB its staff, the local communities of Methil and Burnt Island. I would like to thank the Scottish Trade Union Congress, Unite and the GMB for their continued work with the Scottish Government and BIFAB owners, Canadian fabrication company DF Barnes, to help secure the future of the BIFAB yards. Their continued message of positivity through difficult times for the company and its workforce has helped keep momentum and focus in the five fabrication sector. The need for a new contract to revitalise these yards has been felt deeply across my constituency and has impacted on the local economy in the area greatly, particularly in the community around Bifaz Methyl Yard, where 41% of the individuals live in one of the most 20% of the most deprived areas in Scotland. This is more than double the figure for Fife as a whole. The yard is vital to create local employment and providing employees with highly sought after skills. But more importantly, by bringing local young people into modern apprenticeship schemes and a skill sector that is transferable to engineering sectors across Scotland and even the global manufacturing industry. I have visited the yard on a number of occasions over the course of my term in office and I have learned firsthand from employees of these yards the importance of this employer to the local area and the difference that employment in the highly skilled and well paid positions make to the lives of those living in an area of multiple deprivation. The sooner that by far 1,200 strong workforce can return to the yards of Methyl and Burnt Island, the better. The knock-on effect and a lack of contracts also affects many local businesses that serve the yards, from suppliers and transportation services to local accommodation and plant hire. These businesses have all missed out on revenue due to a lack of contracts and employment. Renewable projects like the £2 billion energy offshore wind farm, which once constructed will generate enough energy power a year for the whole of Edinburgh, only adds to manufacturing an important role that like the Scottish economy and contracts like NNG Wind Farm would ensure and continue to support and enhance the Scottish manufacturing and fabrication sector. This in turn would create highly skilled jobs and would boost both the local area economy and the Scottish economy as a whole. Scotland is a world leader in renewable energy and we have the most ambitious emission reduction targets of any other nation. How could we expect them to compete with companies? Oh, sorry, President Officer, turned over too many pages. But there is no sense of striving for greatness in these areas and not capitalising on the opportunities they create. They have a potential to be benefit entire Scottish manufacturing supply chain, breathe life back into the yards like Bifab, and give hope back to communities that they support. The Scottish Government, along with the UK Government, must use all of its powers available to maximise the ability of Scottish companies like Bifab to benefit from contracts being awarded in the renewable sectors. My question many of my constituents ask me, why is Bifab not winning contracts? Well, the answer is a simple one. How can we expect a company to compete with companies such as Nirvana Sia, who are allowed to run up losses by their Spanish government owners and can therefore offer prices far below what a Scottish company who strives to, at the very least, break even by producing the high quality work carried out by well-paid employees? We cannot expect BIFAB to tender and win contracts when they are not competing on a level playing field. The Scottish Government's strong support for BIFAB is the reason we are able to debate this topic today. Without the Government's intervention in the company and the commitment to BIFAB's sustainability, there would not be the same hope or future for the company that there is today. By becoming a minority shareholder, the Government brought the company back from the brink of closure. Additional investment from a well-established DF Barnes has revitalised the vision for a burnt island in Methyl Yards to maintain constant, consistent contracts and become a stable employer they once were. The First Minister has personally visited the yard and the people on the ground fighting to keep fabrication industry alive. The Government have re repeatedly demonstrated their commitment to the yards and I, as well as a large number of my constituents, appreciate this continued support. I am aware of that investment that the Scottish Enterprise has put into Methyl Yard to modernise it and update the facilities to keep up with the demands of modern fabrication. What BIFAB needs now is, this, is for that support to result in new opportunities for fabrication and construction in the marine, renewable and energy sector in Scotland. Not only because it is in the Scottish, Scottish taxpayers' best interest, but because the people of Methyl and Burnt Island desperately need the moral boost and of a newly awarded contract will bring. In conclusion, President Officer, the Scottish manufacturing supply chain must see a benefit of the Government's commitment to renewable energy 
and emissions reductions, and the billions of pounds of a contract that this commitment will bring. The sector's highly skilled workforce must be given the opportunity to contribute to that cause and benefit from creating a better, more sustainable Scotland. Employment for the renewable sector will not only benefit by fab yards in Methil and Burnt Island, but the wider manufacturing and fabrication sector across Scotland. Presiding Officer, EDF Energy have a moral duty to support the Scottish supply chain and grant the economic benefit of production of the NNG wind farm to the very area that it will call home. After all, once the NNG wind farm is completed, EDF will make billions of pounds worth of profit over the course of the site's life lifespan. I believe it would be a shameful mark on Scotland's industrial history if BIFAB received no work as a result of the country's commitment to carbon neutrality and investment in renewable energy. Thank you very much. I call Bill Bowman to be followed by Stuart McMillan. Mr Bowman, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I refer to my Register of Interest Rear Fund with Energy Industry Holdings? Today's debate comes as Scotland builds its renewable energy in on and offshore wind, solar and hydropower. Many of these energy initiatives are realised through competitive international contracts and it is through a spirit of collaboration that the industry has seen huge development over the years. However, our economy is struggling. The government's labour productivity statistics show that Scotland has not improved its productivity on global league tables since 2007 and our growth is forecast to be slower than the UK as a whole from 2020 up to 2023. Add to this the threat to BIFAB in Fife and you could be forgiven for thinking that this is simply another example of a sector trying to grow under tough economic conditions. However, the Parliament was made aware last week that less than a third of the jobs that were promised by this SNP government in Scotland's renewable energy sector have been delivered. Nonetheless, Scotland's renewable energy sector has strong support from a number of industries and corporate bodies who are committed to seeing this country continue to lead the way in creating a greener and more energy efficient world. Scotland's growing capacity for renewables has translated into a significant, significant increase in renewable el electricity output, which has more than tripled from 2007 to 2018. Turnover from renew renewable energy activity in 2017 was about 5.5 billion, and perhaps more significantly, the renewable energy sector accounts for 17,000 jobs across Scotland. This growth is supported by industry bodies, including Scottish Renewables, and initiatives such as the offshore wind sector deal implemented by the UK government. This deal pledges to drive the transformation of offshore wind generation, boosting the productivity and competitiveness of the UK supply chain. Despite the Scottish government's pledge to help our renewable energy sector grow... Cabinet Secretary. Uh, could Mr Bowman we appreciate taking the intervention, name a single legal measure that we could have taken, that we haven't taken, that would have secured work for BIFAB or any other yard. Bill Bowman. I think proving negative is a different, um, a difficult exercise. I think what the issue is, you have to work with the UK government to find the areas where you can implement these measures. We are seeing the consequences of a lack of structural investment in industry foresight which leaves our Scottish renewable industries at a disadvantage compared to European competitors. Furthermore, presiding officer, it's not just the workforce who are affected. Local businesses feel the squeeze too, which makes the example of BIFAB about more than just one firm. It's about the wider environment for businesses and this SNP government's failing approach to the economy. The example of BIFAB is depressing on many fronts. The overlooked yards are a devastating situation for the local economy. They are ready and waiting to get started on work that could create jobs for over a thousand people, unlocking much needed investment and growth for the region's future. The Parliament shares the concerns of the STUC who understand that little of the work of fabricating jackets for wind turbines will come to Fife. It is encouraging to see the efforts of Scottish Enterprise, who, invest, who have invested in hard standing infrastructure and piling works at the Fife Quayside, and GMB Scotland and Unite who have launched the Ready for Renewal campaign. These efforts will help ensure that construction of parts for Scotland's offshore wind farms do not happen halfway around the world. Presiding officer, our renewable energy sector is crying out for help to fulfill the demands that we place on it. Feedback given to the Economy, Energy and Fair Work Committee highlighted a lack of industrial strategy for offshore wind and more broadly for the whole renewable sector. It is crucial that we start to grow our economy and put infrastructure in place to allow the renewable energy sector to reach its potential. 
However, this can only be achieved through a change in mindset. The motion focuses on five, but the offshore wind farms are in range of the fourth and Tay ports. In my region, Dundee and Montrose have the credentials to be considered for oil and gas decommissioning work and the construction and maintenance of these wind farms. We need to include such facilities in a joined up approach to supply chain management. Dundee's council leader last year said he hoped to bring 1.8 billion investment to the city to build 54 turbines. However, the first minister admitted to the STUC conference last month that this government had not been as successful in winning contracts as it had hoped. It's a long time since the Tay was home to many of the finest wood, iron and steel shipbuilding workshops in the world. But the strategic position of Dundee, along with the need for high quality construction jobs in the wake of difficulties elsewhere, makes an ideal place to build and decommission renewables. We want to see Scotland at the forefront of new jobs and renewables, but the SNP's government's muddled approach to supporting businesses put that at risk. We on the Conservative benches are proud to be part of a UK which is reducing emissions faster than any other G20 country by 29% in the last decade alone. Presiding officer, Scotland was once of the workshop of the world. With more involved direction and financial support, we can continue to lead the way as a renewable energy innovator of the world. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Stuart McMillan to be followed by Lewis MacDonald. Mr McMillan, please. Thank you very much, Signing Officer. Signing Officer, I start by, uh, by offering my support from everyone in Inverclyde to our friends uh, in Fife. Uh, we wholeheartedly support the campaign to, to actually get, these, get this work and get these jobs in Fife. It's so important, uh, uh, it's so important actually for, for Scotland's uh, industrial strategy. It's so important for Scotland's uh, industrial uh, future as well. Now, I'm saying this because uh, I mean, in my community in the Greenock and Inverclyde constituency, uh, we went through uh, a huge amount of change over the years, uh, as colleagues will know. And uh, certainly in 2014, the Ferguson shipbuilders in Port Glasgow closed down. And it was uh, because of the, uh, the support of the Scottish Government that actually, uh, that actually brought that shipyard back to life. And I know that uh, talking to, uh, to, to people in my constituency, who absolutely understand the importance uh, of, of manufacturing, uh, to, uh, manufacturing for Scotland's economy, but also for manufacturing for Scotland's future. Now, part of the, uh, of the, the, the motion in front of us uh, from the Labour Party highlights the, the aspect regarding the, the emissions being, uh, being generated by transporting the, the final product from potentially from Indonesia to, uh, to 10 miles uh, off the coast of Fife. Now, uh, that's actually a similar situation that's been raised uh, by, the, uh, by the heritage rail sector uh, in, in the UK as well. Now, very much, and I admit, very much on a smaller scale, because uh, coal is shipped from, from Colombia over to the UK to actually go into that particular sector. Now, thankfully, there's a reduced level of coal that's actually been shipped uh, because the, the sector themselves are reducing the amount of coal that's been used uh, in, uh, in, uh, in their particular uh, in, in a particular uh, rail uh, uh, engines. But uh, it's a similar idea, it's a similar situation. But, uh, so I, 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 just, I just can't understand uh, this whole aspect uh, of, the, of potentially shipping these, uh, these jackets over, uh, to, over, to the, uh, over to Scotland because uh, this, the, the emissions generated uh, certainly uh, just flies in the face uh, of, uh, of what these uh, what, what the final product, what these turbines are actually supposed to be doing in terms of actually helping, uh, helping the environment. Um, a second point uh, I want to touch upon, Richard Leonard spoke in his comments earlier on regarding that uh, he wants a, a, an interventionist uh, state. Now, uh, if it wasn't for the Scottish Government, then Ferguson's Marine, so with Ferguson shipbuilders in, in 2014, would not have come back into being. Then uh, Liberty Steel would not be operating uh, in, in Lanarkshire. Uh, and, uh, and, I, and I just think that there have been many examples uh, of actually where, uh, so just uh, one moment if I may, uh, that there have been many examples of actually where the Scottish Government actually have helped to either bring an industry back or to save an industry. And one other, just to my constituency before I let you in, uh, Mr Leonard, and that's in Texas Instruments uh, in Greenock uh, in, uh, in my constituency. And that was, that was through the, uh, a task force that was set up, joint working, uh, between the Scottish Government and Inverclyde Council uh, that actually helped bring some type of, uh, some type of solution to that particular issue. Richard Leonard. I thank the member for uh, taking an intervention and uh, we applaud 
uh, the defensive rescues which have been mounted by the Scottish Government in steel, Ferguson's, aluminium and so on. But does he accept that there is a need for a proactive, forward-looking uh, industrial strategy which isn't simply defensive and reactive, but which is proactive? Stuart McMillan. Well, that's exactly one of the things the Scottish Government actually has been doing uh, in recent years. But planning ahead. I mean, it was an announcement actually, I don't know if Mr. Leonard saw this earlier on, and we're actually on the same page in this, we don't have to fight in this. It was the, the announcement regarding the, the Advancing Manufacturing Challenge Fund, a £40 million pounds fund, and that's uh, money is from the, uh, supported by the European Regional Development Fund. So the Scottish Government actually are uh, doing what Mr. Leonard is actually asking to do. Uh, another point I want to touch upon, it was, that, it was uh, um, Dean Lockhart and Bill Bowman. Uh, I genuinely was disappointed uh, by their contributions. Now, if that was them attempting to, to have a, a Team Scotland approach, then, then, then I don't know what they're like actually when they're uh, trying to be oppositionist. I mean, it generally was, well, hold well on one moment, it generally was really surprising because, I mean, at the very outset, Mr Lockhart stated uh, that, uh, that his party was going to support uh, the motion and the, the amendment by the Scottish Government. But then they go on just to actually tank uh, the Scottish Government and their contributions. And that genuinely was really disappointing because, I mean, it's, to me, as someone who grew up in Port Glasgow, uh, someone who actually witnessed the decline of the shipbuilding industry and of the industrial, uh, most of the industrial industry in my community as a child, and someone who was affected by it, like many other thousands of kids in my community, it really was disgusting to hear some of the comments, and I'll take Mr Lockhart's intervention. Well, you're in your last minute, so this will be a short intervention. Very, very quickly, just to clarify, uh, most of our comments were based on the GMB uh, report uh, called uh, Broken Promises and Offshore Jobs. They weren't comments from us. They were reflecting stakeholders' views on the failures of the Scottish Government in the renewable sector. Mr McMillan. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, once again, selective comments from the Conservative Party. Very much selective comments from the Conservative Party. But uh, I am conscious of time, uh, Senator Officer. But generally, I, I know that I speak for my community, that my community and my constituents will want this work to come to Fife. But it's a good thing for Fife, it's a good thing for Scotland, and it's certainly a good thing for Scotland's industrial future. And that's something that I'm sure that every single person, even the Tories, should actually agree on today. Thank you very much. Thank you. I call Lewis MacDonald, be followed by Gillian Martin. Mr MacDonald, please. Thank you very much. Nurse Nagai, the power of the wind could stand for more than just a way of generating electricity. It could become a symbol of energy transition too if the operators of the wind farm in the Firth of Forth chose to make it so. Those operators are EDF Electricité de France. Uh, as we have heard, a state enterprise from another European country, and like Equinor from Norway and Vattenfall from Sweden, now playing a major role in offshore wind here in Scotland. Of course, Niers Nagai is not the only interest of EDF in Scottish renewables. The company has onshore wind farms in operation from Sutherland to Galloway, among a total of 35 sites across the UK. In the Isle of Lewis, EDF has developed plans for major onshore wind farms. One taken forward with the community landowner Stornoway Trust through Lewis Wind Power and Ocean Nation now being taken forward by the owners of the Ishkin Estate. Lewis Wind Power, apply, wind Power applied only last week for a new consent for the Stornoway Wind Farm, precisely in order to make it more able to compete with offshore wind farms like Nears Nagai in the North Sea. And the Isle of Lewis is particularly relevant here for two reasons. First, the planned site of the Stornoway Wind Farm is a near neighbour of the Arnish Fabrication Yard, operated by Bifab. And so EDF is already well aware of Bifab from a Lewis as well as a Fife perspective. Secondly, the success of Lewis Wind Power and all other renewable developers in the islands depends on being able to sell power to customers right across the British mainland, which is only going to happen when Lewis is connected to the GB national grid. I met EDF last year to discuss the strategic importance of islands wind in meeting renewable energy targets for Scotland, for the UK and for the European Union. I have made representations to Ofgem on behalf of Scottish Labour and I know the Scottish Government and others have done precisely the same. We all agree that the regulator Ofgem needs to be more ambitious in supporting renewable energy development in the Western Isles and it needs to endorse plans for an interconnector from Lewis to the mainland, which can carry 600 megawatts 
rather than just 450 megawatts of renewable electricity. Now, we have argued for a larger capacity interconnector because we want to stimulate and encourage more renewable energy in the islands. <clears throat> Not just large-scale onshore wind, but potentially wave energy and community renewables as well. EDF want that too. Of course, they also have a commercial interest in securing the means for carrying future additional power to the mainland. There's nothing wrong with that commercial interest, but allying commercial interests with policy objectives cannot be a one-way street. EDF is itself a state-owned enterprise. It wants to work with governments and political parties on taking forward policy objectives which converge with their own commercial interests. Well, that's fine, but they also need to use their commercial clout in support of wider policy objectives which will benefit the renewable energy sector as a whole. That is what we are calling on EDF and other renewable energy developers to do today. As the STUC put it last week, a company which has benefited from development consents and which seeks political support on policy issues also needs to be a company that does the right thing. And the right thing in this context is to maximize the economic benefits of renewable energy by placing major fabrication contracts with Scottish Yards. And in the case of Nyash Nagai, that means the by five yards at Methil and Burnt Island. As Richard Leonard reminded us, Burnt Island fabricators in Fife and Lewis offshore at Arnish have been major suppliers over many years of infrastructure offshore for the oil and gas industry. Those days are gone. And when Lewis offshore ran out of work, it was bought out by Bifab. And when Bifab ran, out, ran into trouble, it was bought out by DF Barnes. DF Barnes are also a company with years of experience in oil and gas fabrication in Atlantic Canada and elsewhere, which has made a conscious decision to diversify here in Europe into offshore renewables. That is a choice which deserves support. And even more than the company, the workers at Bifab deserve support, not just from government, but also from the renewables energy sector itself. And that is to start with EDF at Nearest Nagai and with tier one contractors like SIFEM, who have also been mentioned today. It is difficult to see how transporting offshore production jackets from East Asia to the Firth of Forth could be more profitable than fabrication here in Scotland unless the terms and conditions of the workers in Indonesia are truly dire and workplace safety non-existent. That can hardly be the right thing to do. If production in East Asia on that basis really is price competitive, that will only undermine fabrication, other fabrication yards which do the right thing, not just in Britain, but across the European Union. And I hope ministers are seeking to cooperate on these issues, not just with the UK government, but also with the EU, because there is an interest in keeping out uh, uh, or in preventing the undermining of commonly accepted uh, working conditions. Ministers in the Scottish and UK governments have real clout in their relationships with offshore wind developers as licensing authorities inshore and offshore, and I was pleased to hear much of what Derek Mackay had to say. Governments need to work together in order to develop a shared strategy for offshore wind, which requires not just warm words about local content, but actual delivery. And if ministers in both governments, in spite of some of the things we've heard today, can take a joined up approach, and if EDF, as a result, choose to do the right thing, then Nyrsh Nagai can also be Nyrsh Erson Ma, the power of the wind, and a force for good as well. Thank you very much, Ms. McDonald. I call Julian Martin, who followed by Alexander Stewart. Ms. Martin, please. Thank you, President Officer. Scotland is a country of engineering and innovation. The engineering and manufacturing past with Scotland was the bedrock of employment for generations of people. From the bridges we've built all over the world to the ships built, which have sailed all over the world, to the oil and gas platforms that give so much work to the people in my constituency and beyond and have engendered the experience we've exported all over the world. Now we're on the next wave of engineering and innovation with our pressing need to create more renewable energy. It's estimated that as we address the climate emergency, we'll need to stop burning hydrocarbons and heat our homes and power our transport with clean energy. So the demand for clean electricity will double at least and we're committed to that power coming from renewables. I fully support the Fife Ready for Renewal, cam uh, Renewal campaign and I fully agree with the calls for the manufacturing work associated with that to be produced in the Inchcape and Seagreen offshore wind farms to be won by local firms like Bifab. Of course, my constituency 
has the Aberdeen offshore wind farm, which is currently producing enough clean electricity to power hundreds of thousands of homes. I think it's 70% of the needs of Aberdeen City every day. But it's been well, well documented that the wind turbines and subsea structures that make up the wind farm were produced elsewhere. It would be a great shame if the workers and people of Fife were to find themselves unable to benefit directly from the projects off their coastline as well. And I wholeheartedly agree that uh, the import of hardware from across the world is completely at odds with our efforts to reduce the very emissions we want to avoid as we move towards a low carbon future powered by that, car that hardware. We should be doing everything in our power to squeeze every last drop of economic activity out of large infrastructure projects for local workforces. And where we don't have the power, we should be campaigning together to get it devolved to this parliament. And in the meantime, working together to get the UK government to do the right thing. And I'm delighted to hear that the Scottish government is going to use the powers that are now in place with the recently passed Crown Estate Bill to incentivise the supply chain for such projects to be in Scotland. But the ability to harness the economic potential of the renewable energy revolution over onshore wind farm subsidy, contracts for difference, contract conditionality and energy taxation, they all lie with Westminster. And the Cabinet Secretary has outlined the implications of the management of these powers at UK level for Scottish manufacturers and in so doing schooled Dean Lockhart on these matters. Um, I share Stuart McMillan's frustration at the Tory speeches. He might be disappointed. I'm just completely bored of it. And I am uh, in a position, same generation as Stuart McMillan, that my parents uh, were at the very sharp end of what the Tory government in the 1980s did to manufacturing in Clyde Bank. I want to pay tribute to the work of energy journalist Dick Winchester, who writes in Energy Voice. He's long been a, a campaigner to get the manufacture of renewables infrastructure to be based in Scotland. And uh, in many ways, the, what's happened with Bifab is a watershed moment. If things don't change, local companies will lose out time and time again as we fulfil fulfill the wind infrastructure needs of the future. Conditionality is not completely in our gift but maybe it should be for all our sakes. As well as lamenting the missed manufacturing opportunities of the Aberdeenshire, uh, Aberdeen offshore wind farm, uh, Dick Winchester has pointed to the development of projects such as Batwind, uh, which involves a battery-based energy system. And that system is, uh, the technology comes from Unicos, a German-American technology company. But he points out that there's actually companies in Caithness that could have, have won that. Areas across Scotland should be able to share in this potential. But heaven, heaven help us if that were left to the Tories. Now the Scottish Government welcome and speedy commitment to reducing the emissions that have caused the climate emergency. Now they do provoke mixed feelings in my part of Scotland. I have to be honest about that. I'm on record in this chamber of to uh, talking of the potential economic and social implications a transition away from burning oil and gas could have to the hundreds of thousands of Northeast people who make their living from the exploration and production of hydrocarbons or who are in the supply chain. This transition must be just, it must be managed and it must be invested in. And that's both governments that have to do that. The establishment of the Just Transition Commission by the Scottish Government is of huge importance to the northeast of Scotland. And I can't overstate how important it is that the really, very relevant skills that our people, not just in the northeast, but in Fife as well, are harnessed in that transition to renewables. And serious efforts are made to ensure that we transition justly and fairly. The prizes are there. There are massive opportunities, but we don't want them leaking out of Scotland. Presiding officer, before I've got very short. Mark Ruskell. Giving way, I share the importance of the Just Transition Commission with you. Do you think it's important then that it's put on a statutory basis to stop the Tories uh, decommissioning it and getting rid of it uh, if they ever come into government in Scotland? Julian Martin. Well, um, Mark Ruskell actually knows my feelings on this because obviously I sit in the committee alongside him. I'm not completely convinced it would make much difference. I'd like Parliament to, government to be held account for what happens in the Just Transition Commission. Um, Presiding officer, before I sit down, I'd also lightly, gently suggest to Labour that they be mindful of this as well. The Aberdeen Wind Farm was awarded 40 million euros of funding from the European Union. And with a hard Brexit on the horizon, the loss of funding like this could mean that 
Large renewable projects are, like this are in jeopardy and the jobs that come with them. Let's work together to avoid that situation too, presiding officer. Thank you. I call Alexander Stewart to be followed by John Mason. Alexander Stewart. Thank you, presiding officer. I'm pleased to have the opportunity to participate in the debate uh, Fife Ready for Renewable campaign, which seeks to secure contract production of wind turbine parts at BIFAB. We recognise the need for more renewable energy to help us cut emissions as part of our balanced mix of, of energy sources. And we are clear that the central to that is ensuring the security and supply, affordability and decarbonisation. The right of the investment uh, and the innovation at the cutting edge of technology within our renewable energy sector. We can ensure that we meet our renewable energy targets while creating jobs. And that's the vital, important part we're discussing here today, presiding officer. It's jobs, it's the economy, and it's the livelihood of this location uh, in Fife that is being talked about and other parts. So I pay tribute to the workforce for BIFAB uh, for what they've done uh, in supporting that economy uh, across Fife and other regions. When we are seeking to tackle climate change, it does seem rather ironic to build many of the parts of a renewable energy source, like an offshore wind farm, halfway around the world and then transport it uh, back to Fife. Uh, that makes no sense to anybody. And we've heard from many speakers today about that uh, nonsensical situation that we're finding ourselves in. And transport emissions have remained high uh, and were up to one third overall back in 2016. When we have a company like Bifab here in Scotland that has the capability and has the capacity to build parts of wind turbines while supporting local jobs and supporting local community, it is completely mad uh, for us to even consider uh, having that take place and a wind farm that will be located just 12, 10 miles off the coast of Fife. As we have heard today, some fears are without this contract that the survival of the area and the associated jobs in and around the location will be lost. To that end, we support the calls for BIFAB to be awarded the contract for the wind turbine parts and they will be built closer. Uh, and it's important that we encourage the EDF renewables and have discussions with both governments, uh, the UK government and the Scottish government, to consider the stability to ensure that offshore wind farm in Scotland is practical, is possible, and is encouraged. And it is encouraging to see that the campaign that's been built up includes community groups. It includes the workforce. It has elected representatives across the council, across the parliament, and across parliament's other, other places, and environmentals as well. But I also pay tribute to the trade unions who've worked together uh, to put on this pressure, uh, and, and they have made a massive impact. Uh, and we have to acknowledge that because we've worked alongside them, all of us, to try and ensure that that takes place. Uh, and pressure must be put on to EDF Renewables to make sure that they consider uh, going forward. The Scottish Government has a role in this campaign, and we've heard today from the Cabinet Secretary that that role is being taken uh, seriously, and rightly it should be. But, the, but we also have a stake in BIFAB. The Scottish Government put a stake in BIFAB, so the taxpayer has a stake in BIFAB. And it's important that we acknowledge that and we recognise that. So the Scottish Government has an obligation to ensure that BIFAB uh, can be secured. And we have an obligation as politicians to do all we can. And I say that includes having discussions with UK ministers and the UK government about what can take place to ensure that happens. I would... It would also be uh, naive of us to think that this debate is just about one single firm, presiding officer, because it's not. There is a wider economic environment, uh, and that is being presided across by the government here in Holyrood. Uh, and we've already heard today about the difficulties and the decline that's taken place in some locations and some parts, and that has uh, caused continual uh, disruption across many sectors. Our growth. Is, uh, is forecast to be slower than other parts of the UK up until 2023. Uh, and we already have uh, the, country, the lowest uh, within the European Union. And over the last decade, we've heard uh, and seen that job growth uh, and the, uh, the regions across the UK, and we have the, the smallest uh, job growth in the UK. There have been some worrying trends uh, and some worrying economies for uh, the Scottish government. Uh, and in particular, the government have failed uh, in the past to 
to ensure uh, that we had the renewable. No, nope, I, want, I want to make some progress. Back in 2010, the then First Minister claimed that the offshore renewable industry would create 20,000 jobs in Scotland over the course of the following 10 years. But that did not materialise. Uh, they have also claimed to support renewable energy. But we have seen some companies that, for example, went into administration because the Scottish Government removed all the public funding back in 2014. And we've also heard from uh, situations uh, and, and companies that had, had to see their workforce reduced. So we, we all have to acknowledge that not all of everybody is getting this right. Uh, so there are, there are faults on both sides uh, and we need to work for the communities we represent and everyone who's working together. The UK, the UK government is committed to going further and, and we have seen the offshore wind sector uh, deal, which is bringing 250 million uh, uh, into the uh, situation. And that deal will forecast for us to quadruple the number of jobs in the sector and increase the global uh, by fivefold. Uh, so, presiding officer, we have uh, and we will continue to support. And we in the Scottish Conservatives support the efforts uh, that have taken place within our energy mix uh, to ensure that our economy. Offshore wind farms are a vital component. Uh, so, in conclusion, when try, uh, trying to reduce emissions and, and quite simply does not make sense for, as I've said, commissioning parts of wind farm developments from halfway around the world. And therefore, it's up to all of us to support BIFAB to ensure that the yards, the jobs and the communities which they depend on are looked after. And as I say, I pay tribute to the GMB and Unite Unions for all they've done. And we must do all we can uh, to support and secure Fife and its economy. And that is both the UK government and the Scottish government playing their part. Thank you. Thank you, and I call John Mason before we move to closing speeches. John Mason. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer, and I would add my uh, voice to the many we've already had, uh, supporting specifically BIFAB, but also local businesses in general to get as much work as they possibly can. Uh, I agree with uh, a number of the things that Richard Leonard said in his speech, uh, talking about the failure to plan by the various owners over the years uh, of the BIFAB uh, facility, and uh, suggesting, as I agree with, that profit has been so much of a driving factor rather than the common good. Uh, I would also agree with uh, a number of the points that uh, Derek Mackay made, uh, encouraging that the government is exploring powers, for example, using the Crown Estate, uh, which we now have some control over, and that if there is to be Scottish guarantees, if there are to be Scottish guarantees in the future, then there absolutely must be benefits to the local economy. But as he said, it is the UK government that has more levers of the power, for example, in relation to CFD. The Economy Committee, of which I'm vice convener, uh, had a round table on BIFAB on the 23rd of April. And uh, there certainly were strong suggestions at that meeting that some overseas operators are effectively being allowed to run at a loss every single year, uh, potentially with 35% of their uh, turnover being in the form of a loss, uh, according to the claims that were made. And so obviously, if that is the case, it's not surprising that our businesses are unable to compete. And certainly that is stated by my understanding of the term. Now, it has been suggested that if other countries can bend the rules, then so should we. And I agree that we should not be naive or uh, particularly legalistic in our approach if other people are perhaps ignoring some of the rules or at least interpreting them in a more relaxed fashion. However, I would also argue that the rules are there for a good reason and the best solution is surely that everyone does follow the rules and that the EU or whoever it is a, should be ensuring that there is conformity to them. As Scottish Renewables said in their briefing for today's debate, quote, the procurement processes are tightly governed by UK and European legislation and are focused on providing the best possible value for money for Scottish and UK energy consumers, end of quote. Now, I did ask at committee if it was not the role partly of Scottish enterprise to follow up and potentially complain if state aid rules were being broken in other countries. And I have to say the answer I got back on that particular day did seem to be a bit on the vague side. D.F. Barnes, who were represented at the round table, uh, made the point that in countries like Canada, there are penalties. And if local benefits are not delivered as promised, uh, then somebody has to pay for that. However, in this country, there does seem to be very little comeback if local organizations and individuals do not get the benefits they were promised. 
Uh, and that's where I would point out on some of the things I was a bit disappointed, particularly uh, on Dean Lockhart's uh, comments, that uh, he said, if I got him correctly, that the UK government should, quote, encourage EDF. And I have to say that, and then he was uh, intervened on, I think, by the Cabinet Secretary, and again, he avoided uh, that there should be a commitment uh, and that the UK government should force a commitment. So that is somewhat disappointing. I think Willie Rennie agreed that there should be binding conditions when I intervened on him, uh, although Claire Baker uh, suggested urging EDF. And again, I would say we want to do a little bit more than just urging uh, EDF if we have the power. Uh, I thought Alec Neill's uh, points, many of them were very good, but he did make it very clear that we just do not have the power at the moment uh, to impose any of these conditions. The EU regulations are there to protect decent businesses from unfair competition and to protect taxpayers from paying over the odds for contracts for someone else's cronies. We can all think of times in the past when both in this country and in other countries, contracts were wrongly awarded, not because it was the cheapest price or even best value, but because there were an, was an unhealthy close link eh, between those awarding and those of being awarded the contracts. So whatever happens with Brexit, we must not throw the baby out with the bathwater and go back to these times. We need to get a right balance between fair competition and value for money on the one hand, but absolutely supporting local businesses and jobs on the other. And uh, the points that Lewis MacDonald made are relevant there, that uh, the workforce paying conditions in other countries have to be a factor in that. We also need to focus, as I think we are agreed on, as what we are best at. It's been often said that we cannot compete in mass producing the cheapest products, be that food or engineering products or anything else. But we can compete at the top end, and that's what we believe BIFAB eh, and others can do with the best innovation and the most specialized high quality products. Uh, again, in Scottish Renewables briefing, they give the specific example of CS Wind in Campbellton, eh, where a 27 million pound investment in 2016 has upskilled the workforce and the equipment. They now have the ability to produce best in class turbine towers for the UK and Europe and have doubled their productivity between 2017 and 18. Uh, I was disappointed in some of the things Bill Bowman said. Uh, he failed to suggest uh, when intervened on what steps the Scottish Government could or should have taken uh, to do more in all of this. Uh, and I would suggest that it is his party's commitment to unrestricted free market that has caused a lot of these current problems. And so, for example, uh, Scottish Power was privatised, which could have been a state-owned player in this whole question. So in conclusion, uh, presiding officer, there's a lot of agreement today. Hopefully we will stay in the EU and be part of the single market. But perhaps we need to look more closely at what our competitor countries are doing and either challenge their behaviour or learn from what they are doing. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we'll move now to closing speeches. I call on Jamie Halker Johnson to wind up for the Conservative Party. Uh, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. From across the chamber, it's clear that the level of uh, involvement or lack of involvement of Scotland's businesses in Scotland's renewable supply chain is a matter of real concern and anger. As we've seen in today's debate, the issues faced by BIFAB are set within a wider context of problems with how we support the energy sector, problems, uh, problems that go beyond those detailed in Labour's motion. As Scotland's onshore wind sector grew, with significant support from the public sector, it became clear that much of the work was not falling to businesses here at home. And people are rightly concerned that we're, we risk seeing the same thing happening again in relation to offshore. So as we look to the future, the worry is quite clear, that Scotland serves as a base for renewables, that it is a Scottish research that makes great strides in developing the energy technologies of the future, but that the businesses here simply do not benefit as they should. Now, it'd be foolish to ignore that we operate in a global marketplace. Competition is healthy, it helps drive down the wholesale cost of energy and provides benefits that can carry over to the consumer. But when major projects are taking place in our own backyard, people will quite reasonably ask why much of it, the manufacturing work and the jobs that are created are overseas. We've heard of the expertise that exists here in Scotland. I'd like to, be, I'd like to just make some, I'd like to make some progress, if, if, you, if you will. Much of the legacy of our oil and gas industry, an industry which has been re reasonably successful in creating jo skills, jobs and industry in several parts of the country. And it appears that we can all find agreement that Scottish business should be able to win these contracts, build up local supply chains, create jobs and provide benefit to their communities. Yet it seems, despite assurances, that yards are lying empty while work begins elsewhere. 
While this is not a committee debate, the work of the Economy, Energy and Fair Work Committee is significant in relation to today's discussion. Other speakers have touched on some of our activities, but I think it's important to reflect on what the committee has done to bring together representatives from across the sector. Meeting with them, we heard a number of issues. There was confusion over the application of state aid rules in the industry. The businesses felt that some competitors were not compliant with the rules as they understood them, and it seems as enterprise agencies understood them. Where additional support is being given elsewhere, an unlevel playing field, as the Cabinet Secretary rightly called it, risks being created with undue commercial advantage. Equally, while panelists acknowledged that there was a responsibility to challenge breaches, there did not seem to be a great deal of clarity over how and who. The committee also was, was also provided with a written update from the Cabinet Secretary on the supply chain and fabrication work identified by the Scottish Government following the offshore wind summit at the beginning of the month. This is welcome, particularly the need for a collaborative approach by the Scottish Government and the UK Government, as both the Cabinet Secretary and Dean Lockhart, uh, Lockhart mentioned. But these commitments must be matched with detail and action. And while specific problems exist within BIFAB, the Scottish Government's approach to supporting business clearly has a far wider impact on our economy. It is not only in renewables that we are seeing skills and capacity go to waste, but it is in, renewables, so it is in the renewable sector that we are seeing these opportunities to build a strong domestic supply chain lost time and time again through a lack of preparation and joined up thinking. It, uh, I'll, I'll let the member who asked me first go first, if that's right. Jim I thank Jamie Harcourt Johnson for taking that, the intervention. Just on that particular point, surely he's got to agree that when government policy ensures that there's an, a vast reduction in training, such as apprenticeships, as was the case in the 1980s, then you, surely you're going to actually have a, a shortage in the workforce when, when, the, when the economy is going to change and when there's going to be more opportunity to actually build in the manufacturing sector. Jamie Halker Johnson. I, I mean, the responsibility for apprenticeship and skills and training has been with this parliament here since 1999. Are you suggesting that somehow, uh, can you clarify that point? Because I, I don't want to kind of misrepresent you. Mr Chairman Thank you. Thank you once again. Very briefly, uh, in the 1980s, when government policy changed and apprenticeships were scrapped and youth training scheme was brought in, but a, a, certainly a training scheme that was nowhere near the quality of apprenticeships, then how can you actually go and build ships? How can you go and build these jackets if there was a shortage of the workforce to actually go and do the job? Jamie Halker Johnson. I th I th I'm sorry, but I think you're arguing that we, we lost that 40 years ago and then that, that 40 years period since, in that 40 years period since, Somehow we've had our hands tied. I mean, that, I mean, that's a nonsensical position. SNP speakers today have focused on what they, they can't do and nothing about what they actually can do. No, I won't. No, no, I, no we've heard a lot from the Cabinet Secretary speaking from a sedentary position. Let, let, I'd like to get on. Well, you should be speaking from a sedentary position because I'm still standing. In his speech, my colleague Dean Lockhart noted the concerns with various uh, stakeholders over the Nersh Nagoa project off the coast of Fife and the compelling reasons for bringing jobs and investment to his region. The economic impact would, be, would indeed be transformative. The skills are there and the environmental case, case is clear. And looking wider, Alexander Burnett spoke about the pressing need to support the renewable sector to combat climate change. He also rightly highlighted the need to build the skills required for the future if we're to have a successful industry in Scotland, a point heard by the Economy Committee. Looking at others, uh, Willie Rennie and others highlighted the situation where uh, the supply, to supply green energy machines in this country, parts of those machines are now being shipped from the other side of the world. Both Claire Baker and Alexander Stewart spoke passionately about the impact of uh, these decisions in their area. And they talked about, I think Claire Baker talked about a visit to um, the site. It's a site that I visited myself many, many years ago with former Mid-Scotland and Fife MSP Ted Brocklebank. And it was just after, or not that long after, the Converney Yard had closed and the impact of that was still being very much felt then. Um, and as, as I said, there's been no shortage of SNP speakers today, uh, and, but it was left rather to Alex Neal and I think a little bit from John Mason to actually talk about some, some ideas rather than just the limitations. <laughs> Presiding officer, has the, uh, Scotland has the potential for billions of pounds worth of investment in renewables, stretching forward for de decades to come. In my own region, we have Orkney and Shetland looking not simply at wind energy as part of the changes around remote island wind, but also into the future with innovations in wave and tidal energy. 
Both communities have shown how previously the oil and gas sector can play a significant difference to our remote communities. And now communities across the highlands and islands stand ready to take advantage of the potential opportunities for renewables. And it is right that these communities benefit, that direct and supply chain jobs accompany renew renewable energy. That by taking advantage of the superb facilities across Scotland, particularly those in the highlands and islands, where former oil and gas yards are ready for use for manufacturing, fabrication, and for servicing offshore renewables, that by taking advantage of these facilities, we can help to rebalance the central belt focus of Scotland's economy. It will be disappointing if the Scottish Government cannot work to seize these opportunities, that we see another industry based in Scotland, but not built in Scotland. If we are to lose out on future investment, sustainable jobs, and the chance to boost some of those communities in Scotland that need it most, that really will be a tragedy. Thank you. And uh, Colin Paul Wheelhouse to close with the Scottish Government. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, this has been, for the most part, a valuable and timely debate highlighting the importance this Parliament places on harnessing Scotland's tremendous offshore wind resource to decarbonise our energy system in line with Scotland's energy strategy, but also the strength, clearly, uh, the resolve uh, across this chamber to achieve a fair share of the economic benefit of the construction and operations of offshore wind installations. My colleague Derek Mackay has outlined the routes that Scottish Ministers, Crown Estate Scotland and Marine Scotland are exploring to further support the Scottish offshore wind supply chain. I don't know whether Jamie Halker Johnson just switched off or was out of the chamber. He clearly has not been listening to the, the Cabinet Secretary's speech. I want to close by discussing the work being undertaken through our reinvigorated industry working group. Uh, before that, though, I want to emphasise our view that the UK Government must show greater leadership in areas where powers are reserved, such as securing local content through the Contracts for Difference mechanism, which is the main route to market for offshore wind, both fixed and floating, and which is also reserved power, uh, the power of the UK Government in this respect. The offshore wind sector deal is welcome, and I'll speak more about that in, in a moment. However, I would also gently point out to all the Conservative speakers uh, that energy policy is fully reserved. It is the UK government's uh, role that uh, has led to the axing of rocks, the renewable obligation certificates, yeah. uh, the axing of Scotland's ability to set Scottish rocks, the removal of the feed-in tariff regime, the axing of the minima promised by David Cameron for the marine energy sector, yeah. axed by Theresa May without a general election, and uh, the recent restriction in RHI and renewable heats will take no lessons Absolutely. from the Conservatives Absolutely. on this part of the House Absolutely. about the support for the renewable energy sector. <laughs> and uh, Mr Burnett talked of the inaction, but I will not take intervention the Conservatives. Refused, you refused to take an intervention from me, Mr Lockhart, so please sit down. Mr Bur Burnett talked of inaction, but Scotland has generated in 2018 the equivalent of 74.6% of our electricity from renewables, while the UK has, uh, has generated less than 30%. So who is showing leadership on renewables? Absolutely. Mr Lockhart, Mr yeah. Burnett. And of course, of course, as John, uh, John Mason highlighted, and Bill Bowman was not able to identify one yeah. clear step we oh, could take to have done more uh, to secure procurement of Scottish supply chain in the powers we had prior to Crown Estate being devolved. And the, the Cabinet Secretary has already outlined we are now using these powers to our advantage. We are ensuring the Scottish industry is able to take full advantage of the opportunity presented by the sector deal through restructuring what was previously known as the Offshore Wind Industry Group to get more strategically focused Scottish Offshore Wind Energy Council, which I now co-chair alongside Brian McFarlane of SSE. That group provides a forum for representatives from all areas of the sector to lead key work streams. And this will ensure the work of SOEC is aligned to the deal itself and to ensure Scotland's strong existing and potential supply chain offering is recognised. The supply chain element of SOEC will champion the two Scottish supply chain clusters and explore ways of strengthening and expanding our supply chain to increase local content and future offshore wind projects. While SOEC is largely shaped around the sector deal ambitions, it can of course also react to any other industry issues as and when they arise. Conservative members are seem to have taken a total disconnect from the process of the CFD. The CFD support mechanism run by the UK government, I remind them of that, theoretically offers significant opportunities for our talented workforce and supply chain companies, such as at Bifab, CS Wind, which we've heard about, Global Energy Group in, in NIG and others, with three Scottish offshore projects due to bid into the imminent CFD round. UK ministers have created a policy environment, though, through CFD that encourages rapid cost reduction, which may be welcome, but the commercial risk has been pushed down into the lower tiers of the supply chain. 
uh, with no measures to protect those SMEs worst affected. Scotland has a pipeline of over four gigawatts of offshore wind consented in our waters, with further licensing opportunities being considered by Crown Estate Scotland. However, by focusing so clearly on price alone, we believe UK ministers are failing the wider economic interest with CFD. It's absolutely vital that UK ministers utilise the powers that they have to ensure greater weight is given than at present to supply chain plans that they collect as part of the process when allocating CFD contracts and attach conditionality, as the Cabinet Secretary and others have said. At present, maximum weight is placed on the price per megawatt hour, which has reached a low of £57.50 per megawatt hour, at a time when far more generous funding of £92.50 has been provided as a strike price for new nuclear power in, in Somerset. There is a clear inconsistency in how UK ministers approach technologies and far greater emphasis on the total value added to the UK economy could be achieved if supply chain plans were reflected and conditionality attached as part of rebalancing between price per megawatt hour and the quality of the bids that are received. As we've heard, the sector deal launched by UK ministers sets an industry agreed 60% UK content target by 2030, a key finding of Martin Whitmarsh's supply chain review. While we welcome the sector deal, we recognise it will take significant collaborative effort from industry and governments to ensure its results in meaningful improvement. However, it's absolutely essential that developers uphold their commitment under the sector deal to deliver target levels of local content, and we expect to see substantial increases, particularly in the capital expenditure phase of these projects. Supply chain investment under the Aligned Offshore Wind Growth Partnership is welcome, but insufficient in of itself to achieve what we need to achieve. However, and the Tories should listen to this also, the review also recommended UK ministers should deliver twice the quantum of financial support for offshore wind, with visibility of auctions out to 2030. And given more recent committee and climate change advice to the effect that the UK now needs up to 75 gigawatts of offshore wind by 2050, I will not, Mr Lockhart. Supporting the supply chain now could net the Scottish and UK economies a far greater return over the longer term. Regrettably, Bays have applied a mere six gigawatt cap to the next CFD auction, making it unlikely that the full £60 million budget will be accessible to industry. And I would also say to the Tories, more investment now can mitigate the impact of anticipated slippage in the delivery of Hinkley C. Without the CFD mechanism delivering a strong and visible pipeline of work at the necessary volume, the offshore wind supply chain will struggle to maintain momentum and increase competitiveness. And that would be a missed opportunity to deploy and develop a supply chain that can compete globally. The UK government controls that pipeline. I hope we've made clear today there is a role for the Scottish government, but there is also a role for the UK government. And the Scottish government is using all the levers at our disposal to support this important sector. And we will ensure platforms such as the supply chain summit, summit that the uh, Cabinet Secretary chaired and SOEC deliver the fundamental changes required to strengthen our supply chain and secure the just transition that we are all wanting to seek. However, importantly, UK ministers should take the action necessary to address the weaknesses in the CFD process, review the process, and I hope we can unite in that today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Minister. And now I call on Claudia Beamish to close the debate and wind up for the Labour Party. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The swell in support for climate change action lately has been heartening. I welcome the Scottish Government shifting to the responsible net zero target for the climate change bill. It is exciting to see the growing acceptance from all parties for the need to justify any policy in any portfolio against the climate imperative. I pay respect to the school strikers and young people across the world who are driving forward pu the public backing for this work and further focusing the minds of politicians. It is a climate and environment emergency and that message is getting through. But Scottish Labour cannot emphasise enough that a just transition must be the ultimate driver. Scotland's pathway to the net zero economy must be paved by the Labour movement Safeguarding workers and communities and securing uh, the real new opportunities for the benefit of our new economy across all sectors. My party is clear on these terms. That is why it has been a year since Scottish Labour set a net zero greenhouse gas emissions target, which the SNP at that point refused. And inextricably linked, it has also been a year since we were calling for a statutory just transition commission to serve us well into the future. The Just Transition Partnership, formed by Friends of the Earth and the Scottish Trade Union Congress and joined by others, has worked tirelessly to push this message and to make sure that we design industrial policies to this effect. But the Scottish Government somehow remains unclear as to the need, despite considering 
the, me the, the, me the merit of a commission being on the face of the climate change bill. The current lifespan and footing of the commission fundamentally misunderstands the concerns of workers and the requirements for a resilient future economy. I was relieved when the government con agreed to consider a statutory commission, but as stage two of the climate bill draws closer, I am concerned that that concession might be wa wavering and waning. Workers and communities must not be thrown to the wind. A short-term arrangement can only be a short-term strategy setter and is not fit for purpose. We need vision and direction setting, and direction setting for the long term. And all future governments need to be held to account until we reach net zero emissions across all sectors. And we need clever policy design and support mechanisms so that we come out on to the other side uh, with a fairer society. Scottish Labour supports Fife, ready for renewal campaign by the GMB and Unite, supported by the STUC. And this parliament is, as we've heard today, united in backing them. Along with Richard Leonard and other Labour MSPs and those from other parties, I met with the, with the unions today, shop stewards from Unite and GMB and the STUC. The workforce stands ready and determined to work on this contract. Claire Baker, who has worked closely with the Fife Yards over the years, has made clear the importance of jobs for Fife and that promises must be delivered, and I welcome her analysis today. So, here is a test for the Scottish Government. It is also a test for us all across this chamber. Ms. Beard, as we just ask you one, one second. Can I just ask members, there's a lot of quite quiet conversations going on, but cumulatively the effect is very noisy. Can I just ask okay. you to keep the conversations to a minimum? Ms. Beamish. Thank you. As we have heard time and again in this debate, a Scottish Yard sits ready and waiting. It has the skills, it has the facilities, it has the labour, and crucially, it holds the opportunity to kick-start a decent manufacturing, work in the clean, decent manufacturing work in the clean energy economy where so many jobs have already slipped through our fingers. As Lewis MacDonald said, what are the working conditions in Indonesia? Cabinet Secretary, we have a fragile promise to consider a statutory just transition uh, commission. We have had votes in favour of a Green New Deal, but no further information. We have been assured that the Scottish National Investment Bank will have a green uh, investment focus, but will that bill deliver? And the First Minister assured the Chamber that she supports the Bifab uh, Yard and, and, its, and its workforce. But the workforce has feared redundancy for years and contracts have been missed time and again. When exactly does the Scottish Government expect our manufacturing base to begin to flourish and Scotland's green energy revolution to take off? When will this pattern of offshore jobs end, if not now, with a capable company that this government is a substantial shareholder in? As Richard Leonard stated, the Green Revolution must mean an interventionist state acting on behalf of the people and our industrial communities. The STUC Broken Promises and Offshore Jobs report found that the past promises for jobs in the low carbon and renewable energy economy have not been realised because we haven't developed a Scottish supply chain producing domestic content. Alec Rowley stressed that the unions simply say that they want a level playing field. Yes, very briefly. Cabinet Secretary Democrat. In all the stakeholders and trade unions I've engaged with, some of those are not the issues they've addressed with me. It's others who have chosen to put cost before conditionality of supply chain content coming from Scotland. That needs to change, first of all, from the UK Government, but the further actions that I've revealed today will the Labour Party support me in taking them forward. Right, Crown I'm, Estate I'm and Marine Scotland, point, and that will create the culture of expectation for work to come to Scotland. Yeah. Claudia Beamish. Uh, in, in, the, in the case of the um, NNG offshore wind farm, and more broadly, does the Cabinet Secretary agree that those community and environmental externalities, which we all know about, need to be factored into procurement processes in order to ensure that Scottish workers and communities benefit from the Green Revolution? As Richard Leonard stressed, we have millions of pounds of public expenditure through subsidies and through levies in, uh, in, invested in renewable energy to harness a natural resource with no public accountability and little economic benefit. Alex Neil is right that everything should be reviewed from planning to finance. And the Cabinet Secretary is right that it is important that we, that we don't let the developers off the hook. I welcome the commitment on the Crown Estate licences, if belated. Surely this could have been written into the Act. 
I also welcome the decommissioning arrangements highlighted, but Scottish Government expectations in relation to the supply chains is not enough. This is public money and support must not be given if the work is not to be done here in Scotland. The review of contracts for difference must be robust and respect the necessity of investment in Scottish yards. And I note the Tory recognition of this need. Paul Wheelhouse has, however, stressed that the price alone cannot be the criteria. In, is inconsistency cannot go on. The quality of the bid must be taken into account. Lewis MacDonald stressed that EDF and, by implication, other companies in the sector uh, like to have the political support when it suits them, but now they need to do their bit. And more broadly, he emphasised how important it is for compromise uh, for, for, for companies moving away from oil and gas uh, into offshore renewables that they deserve government support and that the, the renewable sector and EDF is, is certainly part of this. Both governments need to develop a consenting strategy to tie licensing to UK and Scottish content. And more broadly again, is the Cabinet Secretary uh, able to ensure with his colleague John Swinney that the right skills, both initial and transferable, are being identified so workers are ready here in Scotland for the green jobs which are here and are coming. Scottish Labour is committed to working with the UK Labour government uh, when, we, when we reach power to, to create 50,000 green jobs and 15,000 of these could be, and I stress could be, in offshore wind. This will be supported by our Scottish Labour industrial strategy in Scotland and we will make sure that this is driven not by the market but by an innovative state as Richard Leonard has stressed. Changing position on air departure tax was the right thing to do. That policy was calculated to have the equivalent of 30,000 new cars on the road and yet EDF's plans to manufacture and then ship from Indonesia is said to have the equivalent of 35 million cars on the road. The company should be ashamed. Scotland will not hide away from our international responsibility. We are now working together across this chamber to make sure that we reach the ambitious global targets of uh, limiting temperature rise to 1.5. These commitments are right and in line with the principles of justice for future generations and for the global south. But the principle of just transition absolutely cannot be left behind in this climate zeitgeist. It's time to support the industries of our future and the workers and communities of today. This must start with a BIFAB contract. Together, we can do this. Thank you. Thank you very much. And that concludes this afternoon's debate, Build Them at BIFAB. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 17431 in the name of Graham Day on behalf of the Bureau setting out a business programme. Could I call on Graham Day to move the motion? Moved, presiding officer. Thank you very much. And no one has asked to speak uh, on or against the motion. Therefore, the question is that motion 17431 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. So we turn to decision time. The first question is that Amendment 17425.3 in the name of Derek Mackay, which seeks to amend motion 17425 in the name of Richard Leonard on Build Them at Bifab be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next question is that Amendment 17425.2 in the name of Dean Lockhart, which seeks to amend the motion in the name of Richard, Le Richard Leonard be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And the final question, is that motion 17425 in the name of Richard Leonard as amended on Build the Up by Fab be agreed? Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And that concludes decision time. We're going to move shortly to members' business in the name of Mark Ruskell on expanding Scotland's railways. We'll just take a few moments for members and ministers to change seats. <laughs>